Welcome to the Manwa world. On a dimly lit night, the moon cast its luminance across the rain-soaked surroundings. A grand mansion, reminiscent of a palace, stood amidst the downpour, its imposing presence accentuated by the wetness that enveloped everything. The adjacent forest, too, succumbed to the rain, with water cascading down from the upper leaves to the lower foliage. Amidst this atmospheric setting, a sizable window, encircled by the dripping leaves, bore witness to the unfolding drama within. Raindrops trickled down the glass, offering a distorted view of two distinct silhouettes. The girl, adorned in a frock, gazed through tear-filled eyes, seeking recognition as a human amidst the relentless storm. The man, donned in a cloak and clutching a sword, stood silently, his ocean-blue eyes reflecting an unspoken turmoil. In the reflective surface behind the girl, the man discerned her wielding a knife. Abruptly, she raised her head, attempting to strike the man, only to witness him deftly evading the attack. In an instant, a sword cleaved through her heart, accompanied by a deafening thunderclap and a vivid lightning flash that illuminated the interior. As the knife slipped from her grasp, the girl, tears streaming down her face, tenderly wiped the man's eyes, mirroring her own anguish. His face, marked by both physical and emotional pain, betrayed the complexity of the moment. Gently, she wilted away like a flower, her life fading into the abyss. In her final moments, memories of an unfulfilled existence flashed before her, questioning the purpose of the twenty-five years that passed without meaning. Amidst the tragedy, a lingering mystery persisted. Why did he choose to end her life? The girl, in her obliviousness, yearned for another chance, a wish to start anew and escape the tragic fate that befell her. The narrative unfolded in the land of darkness, leaving unanswered questions in the wake of a poignant demise. As she wearily closed her eyes, the burden of her eyelids intensified with each passing second. A haze enveloped her mind, the culmination of which led her to the haunting recollection of her own demise at the hands of her husband. Upon reopening her eyes, she found herself in a starkly different reality standing before a mirror in a room that starkly contrasted with the opulence of the house. The simplicity of her own space stood in stark contrast to the grandeur beyond. Adorned in a resplendent off-shoulder gown, she observed herself in the mirror, a regal necklace accentuating her beauty. Confusion gripped her as she pondered the inexplicable circumstances. A gentle touch on her arm accompanied by a familiar voice calling her name disrupted her contemplation. Milady uttered a concerned figure in a worker's uniform, sporting small glasses perched on her nose. The genuine worry etched on her face bespoke a sincere concern for Adeline's well-being. Are you okay? inquired the woman named Elda, her tone polite yet laced with genuine worry. Adeline, grappling with disbelief, questioned Elda's presence. Elda, who Adeline was certain had met her demise, now stood alive before her. As Adeline wrestled with the incongruity of Elda's existence, fragmented flashbacks cascaded through her consciousness. Visions of Elda's death, Adeline's own revelation at a noble banquet, and the subsequent disapproval of her lowly origins plagued her thoughts. Adeline isn't your child. Count Lawton cheated? My God! Echoed the whispers of disdain that accompanied her revelation, exposing her as the illegitimate child of the Lawton household. A lifetime of enduring the stigma of her lowly birth unfolded before her. Amidst the haunting echoes of her past, Adeline abruptly pulled herself from the clutches of those memories, finding solace in an instantaneous embrace with Elda, momentarily escaping the harsh reality that surrounded her. Milady, Elda inquired with a deliberate slowness, her hands gently enveloping Adeline. Elda stood as the solitary ally in the midst of Adeline's tumultuous existence a beacon of support in a seemingly hellish place. The revelation of Elda's continued existence brought genuine happiness to Adeline, dispelling any notion that this might be a mere hallucination. The palpable reality of the moment reassured Adeline. After a period of shared respite, Elda and Adeline found themselves seated on a bed, the weight of unspoken concerns lingering in the air. Elda, embodying her role as a trusted confidant, broached the topic of Adeline's impending marriage to the Duke, expressing worry for her well-being. 
Indeed, does Lady Adeline not wish for it after all? The marriage with that duke. Elda's inquiry reflected her apprehension, perceiving Adeline's unease about the sudden matrimonial arrangement. Don't worry, Elda. I'm really okay. Adeline reassured with a smile, attempting to alleviate Elda's concern. Yet, beneath the surface, a nervous tension pervaded Adeline's being. I'm nervous, Elda admitted, mirroring her own apprehension for Adeline's uncertain future in the new household. Elda, privy to Adeline's suffering within the Latin household, harbored genuine concern for her friend. That's what I like about you, Elda. Adeline chuckled, tenderly wiping away Elda's tears. The memory of the pretty dress and ornaments she adorned served as a stark reminder that the day marked her engagement ceremony, devoid of any genuine affection, a marriage reduced to a mere contractual obligation. Adeline, contemplating her predicament, pondered the ironic twist of fate that led her back to the Lawton household, where she continued to be treated as a disposable entity. Despite her initial resolve to escape, circumstances inexplicably pulled her back. Now armed with a second chance, Adeline vowed to live life on her own terms. Standing up, Adeline approached the window, gazing into the outside world as her thoughts swirled. Meanwhile, Elda, occupied with her own tasks, remained a steadfast presence in Adeline's journey to reclaim agency over her life. Abruptly, the door swung open, prompting Adeline to turn and face the newcomer. It was none other than the esteemed daughter of the Lawton household, Bianca Lawton. Her lemon-yellow eyes exuded shrewdness, and she held a noblewoman's fan, examining Adeline meticulously from head to toe. I heard that clothes make the person. This isn't bad. Bianca remarked upon entering, her observation laced with a calculated tone. As she took deliberate steps towards Adeline, she unleashed a barrage of cutting remarks, questioning the desirability of a marriage with someone like Adeline. You're lucky. It seemed that you were going to live alone your entire life. Who would want to marry someone like you? That duke has interesting tastes. Bianca taunted, her words designed to wound. Smirking, she positioned herself in front of Adeline, reveling in her apparent superiority. In response, Adeline, undeterred, lowered her head and began to speak with unwavering confidence. You're right, Lady Bianca is the gem of the Lawton household but to think he would choose an illegitimate child like me. Adeline locked eyes with Bianca, fearlessly challenging the disdain that emanated from her. The fact that there's a man who would choose someone like me. I think it's something I should be very thankful for. Adeline's words, laced with a subtle sting, pricked at Bianca's pride. The unexpected defiance left both Bianca and Elda, quietly working nearby, taken aback. Adeline noted the absence of Elda's tears this time, realizing she possessed the ability to alter the future. Determined to assert herself, Adeline continued, There's a man who's at least willing to take me, but... With a sly smirk, she purposely left her sentence unfinished, inviting Bianca to draw her own assumptions. The power dynamic shifted in that moment, as Adeline embraced her newfound strength and confronted the challenges that lay ahead. What? You're merely marrying a lowly duke like him. Did you think I'd get jealous? Bianca, taken aback by Adeline's fearless retorts, lost her composure and unleashed her frustration upon Adeline. Ah, oh, sorry. Our situations are different. You weren't even able to get chosen. Adeline countered, striking a nerve with Bianca through her pointed words. Why you? Gripping her fan furiously, Bianca raised it threateningly fueled by the intensity of her anger. Are you being serious right now? An illegitimate child should have some gratitude. Bianca's shout echoed in the room, attempting to put Adeline in her perceived place. Just as tensions reached a boiling point, a knock on the door interrupted the confrontation. A butler entered, clearing his throat to gain their attention. Lady Adeline, Duke Ben Zark wishes for your presence in the drawing room. He conveyed with respect, bowing his head. Adeline, relieved by the timely interruption, sighed at the prospect of the impending farewell. Passing by Bianca, she whispered with deliberate calmness, then farewell, signaling the conclusion of their tense exchange as she prepared to face the next chapter in her tumultuous journey. 
Adeline! Bianca Lawton's voice echoed from behind, but Adeline had already passed through the door. There was no way for Adeline to discern whether this opportunity was a divine intervention or the result of some enigmatic force. There must have been a reason she returned to the day of her ill-fated marriage, Adeline contemplated as she traversed the corridor. Suddenly, she was reminded of her destination, the place from which no one emerged alive, the land of darkness. A ruthless duke, her ace Ben Zark, ruled over that realm, wielding a power so formidable that not even the emperor dared to challenge. On her way to a reunion with her disreputable husband, Adeline reached the end of the corridor, where the drawing room door awaited her. Pushing the door open, Adeline stepped into the room, bathed in its light. The sudden entrance drew the attention of everyone present. With a hand over her heart, Adeline scanned the room, searching for her ace Ben Zark, the man she loved excessively and died for by his sword. Finally spotting him standing amidst the windows, bathed in sunlight, she could only discern his silhouette. Gradually, she approached him, and as she reached him, his cold blue eyes met hers. Are you Adeline Lawton? He inquired, his gaze piercing and direct, locking onto her eyes. With regal poise, Adeline entered the room, lifting her frock on both sides as she walked, a picture of nobility. A cheerful chuckle escaped her lips as she addressed Duke Ben Zark with a newfound confidence. I do not believe we've met Duke Ben Zark. I'm Adeline Lawton. It's a pleasure to meet you, she declared, summoning every ounce of courage within her to stand before the formidable Duke. Her approach exuded a charm that belied the turbulent journey she had endured. Undeterred by the Duke's stoic demeanor, Adeline extended her hand delicately toward him a gesture that bespoke both grace and courage. Duke Benzark, would you care to escort me? She inquired with a polite and composed tone, her eyes meeting his as she sought to bridge the gap between their worlds. Duke Benzark, in response, regarded her with a blank stare, his deep eyes attempting to decipher the enigma before him. Unbeknownst to Adeline, the Duke had dreamt of a prophecy that foretold a destiny intertwined with hers. Thou who sees the truth, the prophecy whispered, guiding him to find Adeline Lawton and be with her, as it promised that her presence would grant him dominion over the world. Flashbacks of a recent encounter flooded the Duke's mind, transporting him to Ray's parlor. Seated across from Astor Leff, a trusted friend of Ray, Ben Zark engaged in a serious discussion. Astor, a youthful figure with blonde hair, held papers and a pen in his hands, emphasizing the gravity of their conversation. In this complex tapestry of fate and prophecy, Adeline stood poised before Duke Ben Zark, blissfully unaware of the intricate threads that wove their destinies together. The drawing room became a stage for a meeting that went beyond mere introductions, setting in motion a tale that blended courage, prophecy, and the unknown intricacies of their intertwined futures. A detailed briefing unfolded as Astor shared insights with Ben Zark regarding a prophetic dream he recently had. Thou who sees the truth, a potential prophet of significance. Astor emphasized the connection with the esteemed daughter of the Count's household, Adeline. Having already met her, Astor felt it was time to bring Ben Zark into the loop. As Astor delved into the matter, he highlighted the need to act swiftly before drawing unwanted attention to the potential prophet. Expressing concern, Astor detailed Adeline's reaction upon hearing Ben Zark's name questioning the ease with which the marriage was accepted. Ben Zark, seated and attentive, absorbed the information as Astor seamlessly transitioned between questions and answers. Astor proposed a practical solution, suggesting that while an actual wedding might not occur, Ben Zark should personally retrieve the bride. Nonchalantly, Ben Zark inquired about the purpose of such an action. Undeterred, Astor stressed the importance of displaying sincerity, portraying Adeline as a pitiful yet obedient and modest lady. Pulling himself out of these reflections, Ben Zark found himself pondering the terms Astor used to describe Adeline. Modest? Pitiful? The woman before him, in his eyes, did not align with such descriptions. Nonetheless, swayed by Astor's convincing arguments, Ben Zark reluctantly agreed to embark on the mission to bring Adeline home, setting the stage for an intriguing encounter. Intrigued by Adeline's unwavering confidence and composure, 
Ben Zar couldn't help but question if Astor's depiction held any truth. Rarely had anyone met his gaze with such assurance. Ben Zark, momentarily closing his eyes to process the situation, took deliberate steps and brushed past Adeline, breaking the silence with a calm directive. Let's go. Adeline, witnessing his retreating figure, couldn't help but recall his notorious reputation as a formidable man who adamantly refused to partake in weddings. Adeline harbored deep feelings for him over twenty-five years, yet their encounters had been marked by his persistent coldness. She mused on the irony of a man who sought her hand in marriage but expressed himself with only two words. As Ben Zark continued walking at his own pace, Adeline's melancholy thoughts were interrupted by her assertive voice. Will you not escort me? She demanded, surprising Ben Zark and revealing yet another facet of her character. The exchange between them unfolded in a play of demanding gazes, with sunlight casting a soft glow on Adeline's form. Standing by the cart, Ben Zark, adorned in a black suit with a golden long coat, exuded an air of irritation with hands nonchalantly tucked in his pockets. On the sidelines, Astor observed the scene, his hands folded across his chest, keenly observing Ben Zark's apparent annoyance. In response to Adeline's confident query, Ben Zark, looking flustered and annoyed, muttered a rhetorical question. Who's the modest and obedient lady? The unfolding dynamics hinted at a narrative that promised surprises and challenges, setting the stage for an intricate interplay between characters and emotions. Astor attempted to unravel the mystery, recounting his previous encounter with Adeline, emphasizing her prior modest demeanor. Meanwhile, Benzark's voice cut through the conversation, notifying Adeline of the Duchess's carriage arrival and suggesting a return to the mansion. Adeline gracefully emerged from the carriage, holding her dress with precision, only to find herself in a dim, unfamiliar setting. I don't see anything around us. Have we arrived? Adeline queried Ben Zark directly, her gaze scanning the obscure surroundings. The Duchess must go a different route. Have you heard of magic? Ben Zark responded patiently, his attempt to explain met with Adeline's unwavering curiosity, testing his patience. Of course. She chuckled in response, displaying a calm demeanor. Adeline recalled that it was Ben Zark who introduced her to magic in her previous life. Reflecting on those moments, she realized that despite her persistent inquiries, he always responded with utmost sincerity. The realization sparked a bittersweet sentiment. Perhaps it was the very sincerity that contributed to her enduring love for him. Can you also use it? Benzark's question snapped Adeline back to the present, prompting her to consider the prospect of wielding the same magic he once shared with her. The exchange hinted at a deeper connection, weaving together threads of curiosity, sincerity, and the mystical elements that bound them together. It may not be much, but I too know how to use it, Adeline casually remarked, shrugging her shoulders. She couldn't help but reflect on how Benzark had been her guide in mastering these mystical arts. Adeline harbored a sense of gratitude for his teachings, realizing she hadn't been able to reciprocate in any meaningful way. What magic can you use? Ben Zark inquired, seeking insight into her abilities. However, Adeline chose not to respond to his query, simply brushing past him and initiating her departure. Do I have to do this now? I'm tired, she expressed, her tone resonating with clear annoyance signaling her reluctance to engage in further questioning. Ben Zark, turning around, scrutinized her with suspicion. They say the Laden family's youngest daughter is quite modest, but that seems to be far from the truth. Ben Zark commented in a cold tone, prompting Adeline to sharply turn around and lock eyes with him. If that's what you like, then you can just go search for a woman who acts in such a way. She asserted, each word delivered with purpose and clarity. The tension in the air was palpable, and even Astor, observing from a distance, found himself flustered by the unfolding dynamics between Adeline and Ben Zark. Have you used a teleporter before? Ben Zark inquired patiently, redirecting the conversation to the imminent magical endeavor. No, I have not. Adeline responded with nonchalance, casually shrugging her shoulders. People sometimes faint on their first time, so be careful. Ben Zark warned, 
emphasizing the potential challenges of the upcoming teleportation. Preparing Adeline for the experience, he gestured towards the ground, initiating the intricate magic. Patterns began to materialize, and a soothing blue light emanated from them. Adeline, still grappling with the idea of teleportation, affirmed her commitment with a determined tone. I'll try my best, she assured as the teleportation process unfolded. Under the full moon, they materialized on the grounds in front of a dark palace-like mansion. The grass beneath Benzark's feet rustled as he advanced towards the mansion. As that woman should be unconscious by now, so... Benzark began speaking, only to be interrupted by Adeline's voice. Is this the duchy? The trees are cool, and it's a very nice place. Adeline, seemingly enchanted by her surroundings, explored the area with genuine interest. Her appreciation for the scenery was evident in her voice, providing Benzark with a refreshing perspective. Delighting in the simple pleasure of touching each tree, Adeline's reaction added an unexpected layer to the otherwise solemn atmosphere. Adeline, joining her hands in front, assumed a serious tone as she addressed Benzark with a proposal. Now then, I'd like to propose a few things, she stated, looking directly into Benzark's eyes. Do you think you're in a position to be making proposals? Benzark scoffed, mocking her perceived status. Oh, of course. There's something you want of me. You aren't thinking of getting it for free, are you? You are a duke, are you not? Adeline responded with a cool demeanor, unfazed by Benzark's tone, and even smirking in the face of his skepticism. Adeline, are you really a prophet? Benzark questioned, his tone cold. Adeline met his gaze silently, recognizing the prevalent misconception that she possessed prophetic abilities. She chose not to dispel the misunderstanding, realizing that playing along might be the key to unraveling the mystery of her untimely death. Do caress Benzark, I wish to be treated according to my skills. I won't change my surname and will live on as Adeline Lawton, she asserted, placing her hand on her chest and delivering her statement in a firm tone. With deliberate emphasis on each word, she made it clear that she expected Benzark to comprehend the gravity of her request. The unfolding exchange hinted at a negotiation where Adeline sought autonomy and recognition based on her abilities. I won't change my surname and will live on as Adeline Lawton. As soon as Adeline conveyed this decision to Benzark, a contemplative silence enveloped them, both individuals exchanging significant glances in that pivotal moment. Ah, uh, wait a second, Adeline. You do know that you are married to the Duke, right? Flustered by the unfolding situation, Aster hastily interjected, nervously chuckling as he addressed Adeline. Would I be here if I didn't know that? Adeline chuckled, her response laced with a touch of humor as she covered her smile with one hand. I guess that's true. Haha, <laughs> but why? Aster increasingly uneasy in the face of the unfolding circumstances, began awkwardly rubbing his neck, seeking understanding. If you use the surname from before the marriage, other males will continue to court you, and it won't look so good aesthetically to others, Aster explained, laying out the potential repercussions of Adeline's choice. Oh my, are you worrying about me right now? It would have been nice if you didn't start to only worry about me now, but from when we discussed the marriage... Please do not worry. I do not give a slightest care in the world about what others think. Your captain probably thinks the same way. Isn't that right? Adeline seamlessly brought Ben Zark into the conversation, addressing both Aster and her husband. The remark left Aster visibly embarrassed, his face turning a shade of red as he grappled with the unexpected turn of events. Adeline, unapologetic in her straightforwardness, had effectively asserted her independence and indifference to societal expectations. Do as you wish. Benzark, displaying minimal concern, casually walked away from the situation, leaving Adeline and Aster in the aftermath of her proposal. So he says. Adeline offered a smile in Aster's direction, but it carried an undertone of warning, leaving him feeling embarrassed. Ah, uh, Captain! Aster murmured awkwardly in response. Meanwhile, as Ben Zark continued walking ahead, he couldn't shake off the weight of Adeline's proposal. 
It wasn't a bad suggestion. In fact, it would alleviate some of his burdensome responsibilities. Yet, an inexplicable resistance within him prevented him from readily accepting the offer. Lost in contemplation, he pondered whether Adeline's proposal aimed to minimize her association with him. Simultaneously, Adeline reflected on her interactions with Astor, convinced that she had played her cards right. She vocalized her plan to act as the Duchess of Benzark in public but retain her identity as Adeline Lawton in private. I will act as the Duchess of Benzark to the eyes of the public, but I am Adeline Lawton when I'm alone with you people, she declared, drawing Benzark back into the conversation. She then proposed another condition for their arrangement. And I have a romance for marriage ceremonies. When I wish for it, let me have an extremely impressive marriage ceremony. Before then, let us just say that we're in an alliance and pretend to have already gotten married. Adeline, like many other girls, harbored dreams of a grand wedding ceremony, and she made sure to include this desire in her proposition. Ben Zark gazed at her intently, his eyes attempting to absorb the intricacies of her proposal. While it was undeniably a favorable offer, he couldn't shake a sense of dissatisfaction. Shrugging off stray thoughts, he extended his hand, symbolizing agreement with their mutual agreement. The terms were set in motion as they sealed their proposal with a handshake, signaling a new chapter in their alliance. Yeah, let's do that. Ben Zark affirmed in a firm tone, maintaining direct eye contact with Adeline. Their agreement signaled a united front in navigating the peculiar terms of their alliance. Their focus shifted as a young boy, cap in hand, hurriedly approached waving enthusiastically. Everyone, you've returned so soon. It's an honor to meet you, Duchess, he exclaimed, directing his attention towards Adeline. This young boy was Maven, the Benzark household's butler, and the sole caretaker of Adeline in the duchy. Suddenly, Adeline was overwhelmed by flashbacks from her past life, stirring emotions she couldn't comprehend. Tears welled up in her eyes, and she found herself lost in a momentary haze. Duchess. Duchess Ben Zark. Are you okay, Duchess? Your complexion doesn't look so good. Maven expressed genuine concern, observing Adeline's state with a worried expression. Ah, uh, I'm all right. I was just dizzy all of a sudden. Adeline dismissed her thoughts, lifting her hand in reassurance, and replied with a radiant smile. However, the sudden recollection of Maven's fate lingered in her mind. Why did these memories resurface, and were her recollections truly complete? Duchess, you scared me, Maven exclaimed, his concern shifting to relief as Adeline attempted to reassure him. The complex interplay of memories and present circumstances left Adeline grappling with unanticipated emotions. Thank you, Maven. Would you call me Adeline? Adeline attempted to steer the conversation into lighter territory, her eyes sparkling as she looked at Maven. In response, Maven became visibly perplexed, his eyes widening, still clutching his cap in his hands. Pardon! How could I dare to use Duchess Benzark's precious given name to refer to her? Maven expressed disbelief at the notion of addressing Adeline by her first name. The name isn't nearly precious enough for you to care so much about. Feel free to call me Adeline. Adeline, thoughtful with one hand on her cheek signaled her openness to a more casual interaction. Her past life was just that, a past life, and she was determined to prevent history from repeating itself. Do as she wishes, Ben Zark interjected, seeking to conclude the lingering conversation. Maven, surprised, turned towards Ben Zark, and Adeline responded with a smile. Fufu, let's get along! Adeline playfully called Maven Fufu, and joined her hands in front of her, displaying a friendly demeanor. Yes, Adeline. Then would you like to get on the carriage? Maven, dropping the honorifics, sought her preference. Adeline, looking behind Maven, addressed Ben Zark, questioning his lack of action. What are you doing? She called out to him, prompting him to take on the role of her escort. You need to escort me. She insisted, smiling, and he rolled his eyes. Let us depart. Ben Zark stepped forward, offering his arm for her escort. The cart resumed its journey with Maven and Aster seated outside, 
Maven holding the horse's reins. Aster, our duchess seems to be quite unique, Maven whispered slowly, acknowledging the distinctive nature of Adeline's character. Right? She's a tough cookie. Aster, with his hands folded on his chest, seemed to relish the unfolding events. It's my first time seeing our lord sigh like that. Maven chimed in, adding his observation. Is sighing the only thing? I even saw the captain getting flustered. Aster laughed, recalling Benzark's unexpected reaction. Eh? Our lord? Flustered? Such a thing is possible for him. Maven expressed genuine surprise at the idea that someone like Ben Zark could be flustered. Yeah. It was really strange. I guess a lot of things can happen in life. Aster shrugged his shoulders, noting the unusual turn of events. Not once had he seen the Duke express any emotion after he was given away. Looks like things were going to get interesting. Inside the cart... Adeline and Benzark sat on opposite sides. Adeline, looking outside, occasionally found her eyes meeting Benzark's cold gaze. It was uncomfortable. She regretted not choosing to ride next to Maven. She couldn't fathom why he kept staring at her. Monkey. Stupid idiot. She thought of him using these words in her mind. It felt like he was trying to read her thoughts through her eyes, although she knew it wasn't possible. She shook off these thoughts, diverting her attention to the view outside the carriage windows. The barren land surrounded them, and beyond the castle walls lay the forest of darkness. Once past that, the central residence and the black tower loomed. The servants' lodging and stables were also part of that area. Adeline couldn't help but notice the lack of interest in decorating the land within this duchy. It seems that you haven't managed the area at all. All this spacious land feels wasted. It's only being used as a road for the carriages to pass by. I'm thinking of decorating this garden gorgeously. What are your thoughts? Adeline suddenly said, gazing outside the cart, attempting to lighten the atmosphere between them. Do as you wish, Ben Zark replied coldly, still with both hands folded on his chest, appearing disinterested. Oh my, really? Even if I say that I want to make a garden that's even more beautiful than the imperial families? Adeline couldn't believe he agreed so easily, prompting her to propose another condition confidently. Aren't you planning to do whatever you want anyway? You're holding yourself back on a strange matter. Benzar questioned, puzzled as to why she repeatedly sought his approval when she was clearly going to do everything of her own accord. Strange matter? She pondered. Talking to him was surprisingly easy. Why did she suppress herself so much in the past? Was this why people say getting off on the right foot is important? Well, whatever. She was currently a wiry woman who could do whatever she wanted. This was what she deserved. In that case, she guessed she would do everything she had only imagined in her past life. She wondered what kind of trees she should plant in that garden and what kind of flowers to grow in the flower beds. She was looking forward to tomorrow, filled with excitement. As soon as they reached the mansion, Adeline entered and saw servants standing in line, their heads respectfully bowed. The servant at the forefront smiled as they entered, putting his hand over his chest in a gesture of dedication to his job. Welcome. It is a pleasure to serve you, madam. Shall I begin preparations so you may relieve your fatigue? He said politely, his smile reflecting genuine warmth. Yes, I shall leave it to you. I'm a bit tired. Adeline responded with a smile, appreciating the servant's courteousness. Then, follow me this way. The servant directed while ascending the stairs. The third floor rooms are large, and the sunlight comes in well, so it's really great. It's the room next to the master's, so you'll feel safe. Maven followed behind and whispered, adding a touch of reassurance. Haha, is that so? Adeline chuckled, expressing genuine amusement. She was so glad that Maven was alive. How relieved she was to have someone in this mansion to provide her support. They continued walking down the corridor, the servant leading the way. The servant stopped in front of a room, and Adeline instantly recognized it. The room that, in her previous life, wasn't hers. The one that became the domain of Hella Alton, 
the woman who stood beside Ray upon his return, a beautiful figure with scarlet hair and bold eyes. The servant held the handles of the door, turning around with a bright smile. Here is the room you will be using from now on. At last, she finally entered this room. In her previous life, the owner of this room wasn't her. Adeline swore that she won't lose these rights she took for granted this time. She was lost deep in her own thoughts and was walking in the room blankly looking around and thinking all again. Are you satisfied with this room? Adeline heard Benzark's voice from behind. Yes, it is to my taste. She turned around and smiled in response. That's good. Rest, Benzark said and left the room, leaving her behind with Maven. Aster departed with him as well. Wow, Adeline. I was really surprised. Maven expressed in a tone of astonishment as soon as Ben Zark left. Really? Why? She looked at Maven, curious about his surprise. Our master isn't the type of person to look out for someone else's feelings like that. Maven explained, hands on his waist, his surprise evident. Is that so? What would he normally do? Adeline inquired, finding the topic intriguing. He'd immediately just go to his room. Maven rolled his eyes. Ha ha, he is the type of person to do that. She smiled, appreciating the insight into Benzark's usual behavior. Ah, uh, of course, I'm not saying he's a bad person or anything. It's just that his personality is a bit blunt. Maven mentioned casually as he walked towards the door. I understand. Since Maven is saying it like that, I'll believe you. Adeline nodded. Maven was right. Duke Ben Zark might not have actually been a bad person. However, Ben Zark was cold and calculating. Normally, people call that kind of person the worst, but since marriage was a tool for him in the first place, she was pulled out of her thoughts as soon as she heard Maven speaking again. All right. If you need anything, just ring the bell, and a maid will come attend to you. Would you like to dine right now? He turned around and Adeline started walking with him towards the door. Gosh, is it already that time? Adeline asked surprisingly, then she stopped as she realized how tired she was. Well, I'll hold off on lunch. There's a lot to organize while I take a break, she said thoughtfully. Then, will you come to eat dinner? Maven asked, walking towards the door. Of course, Maven. Don't worry about me. Go do your work. She was so happy to see how worried Maven was about her. Some people are literal sunshines in our lives, and Maven was that sunshine to Adeline right now. She couldn't thank him enough. Yes, then rest easy. Maven closed the door behind him as he left the room, smiling. After a while, she was laying down on the sofa, trying to get some rest when the door knocked slightly. Your Grace, may I enter? Adeline heard a light-pitched voice. Come in, she said while laying down there. She didn't plan to get up to greet the incoming person. She was just so tired. A maid entered the room and came in front of her. She bent down her head and greeted her. I am Catherine. I will be taking the role of your grace's servant from today onwards, she said in a low voice without raising her head. Ah, uh, Catherine. As soon as she heard the maid's name, she sat down on the sofa looking towards Catherine in surprise. Yes, your grace. Catherine nodded her head. She got flashbacks of their first meeting where Catherine looked so timid. Take care of me, Catherine. She requested this of Catherine on their first meeting. Yes. Take care of me too. Catherine responded in her low voice. During their first meeting, Catherine showed respect, but she soon started looking down on Adeline. Why do people make light of Adeline when she treated them nicely? I see. What's your age? Adeline asked slowly with one hand resting on her forehead. I am twenty-two, your grace, Catherine replied obediently. All right. I'll call you if I need anything, so leave now. She raised her hands and pointed her to leave the room. Yes, your grace. Then I shall leave, Catherine said slowly and turned around to leave. As she was walking out of the room, she thought of what she should do. Adeline's reaction wasn't great. 
Did she maybe make a mistake? Catherine was lost deep in her thoughts, not realizing she was about to hit a table. A pot was on the table. Ah! She screamed in pain as it hit her. Soon her reflexes woke up, and she turned around. The pot on the edge was about to fall off. Oh no! The flower pot. Catherine thought miserably. It's dangerous! Adeline lunged upon her to save her from this pot, which was about to fall on her feet. Adeline pulled Catherine towards her. Your grace! Catherine's eyes widened as the sound of the flower pot breaking echoed in the room. Adeline was holding Catherine, and both of them looked towards the broken pot. It was a flower pot worth ten months of Catherine's salary. Catherine saw the broken pot sadly. Ah, the flower pot. What should I do? Catherine started biting her nails anxiously, looking down at the floor. Catherine, Adeline tried to call her. I... I apologize. Because of my carelessness. Catherine stared blankly and anxiously at the broken pot and said in an emotional tone. She was about to cry. Catherine! Adeline held her shoulders and tried to get her attention. As soon as Catherine saw her, Adeline spoke softly. I'm not talking about the flower pot. Are you okay? Are you hurt anywhere? Adeline asked her worriedly. Ah... Uh, he pardoned me, because I was in a hurry. Catherine came in front of Adeline and bent down to apologize. It was just a single mistake, nothing to make a fuss over. It's okay, since you didn't get hurt. You don't need to worry about the flower pot. I'll call you again in the afternoon. Adeline tried to clear the atmosphere and smiled. Th thank you, your grace. Catherine could not believe a person could be this soft in such a situation. She was flustered by Adeline's way of handling the situation beautifully and gracefully. Catherine came out and stood in front of the door for some minutes, trying to process whatever happened inside. Her grace is such a wonderful person. I didn't know she would be like that. I was stupid to get envious at the news that she was getting married to the master. How can she look so pretty like a doll? She thought as she walked in the corridor. Her ears and cheeks were red with embarrassment. Catherine got flashbacks of the moment that happened a few minutes ago in Adeline's room. She was so thankful for Adeline's great character. She couldn't believe that she was the personal maid of someone like her. I'm so happy. I must tell everyone how beautiful and cool the Duchess is. I'll make her grace the most honorable person in this house. She talked to herself as she walked down the corridor. Meanwhile, Adeline was wondering why her ear was itching all of a sudden. It was because Catherine was talking about her. Later that day, Ben Zark was staring at the closed door of Adeline's room, and he suddenly remembered what she said to him after teleportation in front of the mansion. Before then, let us just say that we're in an alliance and pretend to have already gotten married. He drew himself out of that memory and looked at her room's door again. Adeline, he murmured. Adeline remained on the other side of the wall. But for Ben's arc, this spatial separation did little to alleviate the weight of the memories from that day. Despite his fondness for the past, he found himself unable to afford the luxury of dwelling on a girl like Adeline. Attempting self-reassurance, he grappled with an unintentional perturbation stemming from the circumstances. Puzzled by the unprecedented intensity of his feelings, he questioned the root cause behind his uncharacteristic unease. Engulfed in contemplation, Aster's knock interrupted Benzark's introspection. The door creaked open as Aster announced his entrance. Captain, I am coming in. Benzark, lifting his chin from his hands, responded with a surprised inquiry. What is it? Aster, closing the door behind him, approached the desk with a measured stride. As Aster positioned himself in front of Benzark, he adopted a professional tone, beginning his communication with succinct clarity. Well, I wanted to discuss our future plans, but I was also intrigued by your thoughts, came the opening statement, delivered with a degree of assertiveness. The response, however, was curt and dismissive. If you're going to speak nonsense, leave. Undeterred, the speaker pivoted to a topic with more weight. It's a different story if it's about prophecies. This triggered a contemplative response. 
Ah, prophecies, how that woman said she was going to open my eyes. Then it probably means I'm going to be able to differentiate between Devis and Azuras, right? A brief clarification ensued, defining Devis as heavenly beings and Azuras as demonic beings. However, the focus quickly shifted to interpersonal dynamics. Hold on a second, Captain. It's about something else, but... Don't tell me you're going to continue calling Adeline this woman or that woman, right? Adeline is a duchess now. If you continue to address her that way, the hired hands are going to look down on her. In response, a counterpoint was raised. Look here, A.S. Is her title what's important right now? There are a mountain of things to talk about. A.S., undeterred, emphasized the significance of the issue. No, I personally think that this is the most important issue at hand. Adeline is your family now, Captain. You might have forgotten it, but humans normally live their lives while forming relationships. They betrothed and marry them. They have kids with them and create a family. You should already know that I don't have the luxury to be playing house like that. He was well aware of Aes's underlying message. However, the year was 512, and after the heavenly demonic war ended with the defeat of the Devis, their focus had been solely on reviving the heavenly realm. Sixty years had passed since he barely managed to awaken A.A.S. and Wacken, with no traces of the other Devis found, and scant information about the Demon King and the entrance to the demonic realm. So, was there a message from Wacken? Were they able to find traces of the Devis who entered Tranquility? In response, A.A.S. provided an update. Wacken did contact us, but it was mostly useless information. Well, they were able to find traces but couldn't stay too long because of how cold it was. See, this is why you should have left things like this to me. Stupid Wacken. They're not patient at all, and they're such a crybaby. They really aren't patient. Arg anyways. Once they return, we should go to the Land of Ice. It might be best for you to join us then, Captain. It's quite far, so even if we use teleport, it'll take a few days. Since I don't have a lot of divine power left, I guess there's no other choice. A moment of reflection led to a realization. The woman had mentioned using magic. Was it possible to be a prophet and use magic? The Devis Tree of Life was dead, and the Tree of Azura should have also weakened with their leader in hiding. This explained the disappearance of beings capable of using magic, as the tree was the source of both divine and demonic power. With the withering of the tree, such powers naturally dwindled. As Adeline Lawton, the one who sees the truth, was prophesied to open Benzark's eyes, he wondered if her ability to use magic was connected. What did it mean to see the truth? Divine and demonic power? As these thoughts swirled, a discomfort lingered, prompting the question, why did he feel uneasy and peculiar when looking into her eyes? The memory of her face especially her deep purple eyes, intruded upon his thoughts. The afternoon arrived, bathing the interior in golden light. Dimly illuminated by the afternoon sun, everything in her room exuded calmness, devoid of any disruptive noise. On the bed, she peacefully slept until the moment her eyes fluttered open, momentarily adjusting to the light. Lifting her head, she surveyed her surroundings, finding the atmosphere strangely unfamiliar. Her gaze wandered from the ceiling to the curtains surrounding the bed and the unfamiliar canopy. What was this canopy? She pondered, attempting to reconcile her surroundings. The effort to recall gradually intensified, and as she pressed her mind to remember, a sudden clarity washed over her. The disorientation of sleep faded, and she realized she had returned to Ben's Ark Duchy. No longer reclined on the bed, she sat upright, gazing blankly outside the glass window. Her focus, however, wasn't on the scenes beyond the window. Rather, it was absorbed in introspective thoughts. Reflecting on the improbable nature of her resurrection, how she died but returned by traversing time, she marveled at the absurdity of her newfound existence. Lost in contemplation, the knock on the door abruptly snapped her back to reality. Your grace, it is Catherine, echoed Catherine's voice from beyond the door. Come in. Adeline exclaimed loudly, ensuring Catherine could hear her. The door swung open a moment later, 
and Catherine, after excusing herself, entered the room with her head lowered. I came to ask how you would like your dinner prepared. Catherine inquired, her voice hushed, head still bent. You came just in time. I was right about to call you, Adeline replied, offering a smile. Then shall I lead you into the dining room? Or would you prefer I bring the meal here? Catherine respectfully posed the options, maintaining her lowered head and avoiding eye contact. I'll eat in the dining room, Adeline decided, attempting to rise from the bed. Mid-sentence, she paused, noticing Catherine's persistent posture. I can't leave the room like this, so can you help me? Her words trailed off as she observed Catherine's unyielding stance. Were you planning on staying frozen like that? Adeline pointed out, gesturing towards Catherine's posture. Caught off guard, Catherine's face flushed with embarrassment. Be but how could I dar dash? She stammered, unable to complete her sentence. Raise your head. I don't enjoy having conversations while looking at the top of another's head. Adeline urged, attempting to lighten the atmosphere, encouraging Catherine to lift her head without hesitation. Slowly, Catherine complied, revealing a red-faced countenance. Adeline responded with a cheerful smile, stepping forward. See? It's such a waste of that pretty face. Adeline cheered her up, adding, It's much better now. Th thank you. Catherine expressed in a slow voice, her admiration for her duchess growing. Adeline, in her eyes, was proving to be a remarkable duchess. Anyways, come here and help me dress myself. There are wrinkles on this dress, so I should change myself before heading Dow Dash. Adeline continued speaking as she walked toward the wardrobe and opened it. However, her words trailed off as she unexpectedly discovered the wardrobe empty, devoid of any clothing. Shocked, she stared at the emptiness before her. Ah, uh, I, uh, I apologize, your grace. It seems like we haven't properly prepared clothes for you. I'll quickly leave and go purchase some tea dash. Catherine, at a loss for words, gathered courage to speak her mind. At this hour? Can you even go to the capital's dress shop? Adeline inquired. I can't but... Catherine's head bowed once again. It's fine. I wasn't trying to blame you, Catherine. Adeline reassured, attempting to lighten the atmosphere. She knew it wasn't Catherine's fault. Adeline then walked towards the wall, aware that Ben's Ark would be behind it. Intentionally putting her hands around her mouth, she spoke loudly. The lord of this house is that guy, and he should be at fault for not being prepared to welcome his bride. It isn't your fault. Ensuring that Ben Zark could clearly hear her. Catherine, could you please call Maven over? Adeline turned around and requested. Why, yes. I will be back in a second. Catherine responded, promptly disappearing. As soon as Catherine left, Adeline looked thoughtfully at the walls and murmured. It seems like there's a lot of work to do. And it also seems like I need to teach Ray how to properly treat the lady of the house. After a while, Catherine returned with Maven. The door knocked again, and Adeline heard Maven's voice. Lady Adeline, it's Maven, he informed her. As he entered the room, Adeline, standing near the window and gazing outside, turned around upon hearing them and smiled. I heard that you called me about the matter of your dress. That is correct. I have something to request of you, Maven. Could you please bring me a few of His Grace's clothes? I need to change right away, but as you can see, there aren't any dresses prepared. She said, smiling ear to ear and gesturing towards the empty wardrobe. Maven was visibly shocked by this unexpected turn of events. His Grace's clothes? He stammered, struggling to process the unusual request. Why would Lady Adeline want to wear Lord Benzark's clothes? Yes, his clothes, Adeline confirmed. Seeing Maven still clueless, she chuckled and clarified. The person who created this situation is the Duke who didn't take care of me. But that doesn't mean I could just put on whatever, right? Therefore, his grace should be at fault too. While you're at it, please bring some of his finer clothes. She sought to reassure them that they were not at fault for this wardrobe mishap and suggested fetching Benzark's finest attire. 
Don't tell me this is... Maven paused, his eyes sparkling with joy and hope, then continued. Adeline, you're trying to turn our lord into a proper human. Catherine's eyes mirrored the joy, secretly praising Adeline for her coolness. There are no bad dogs. First, we need to sort out the hierarchy. Adeline chuckled. Understood. I will prepare it right away. Maven exclaimed, running off with unbridled joy. I will also bring someone who's good with the needle. Catherine followed him without wasting a single second. Alone in the room, Adeline couldn't help but laugh at their enthusiasm. Oh my, they're much more passionate than me, she murmured. Reflecting on her current life, she marveled at the unexpected experiences she now faced. In her previous life, she was unable to do anything in the dress room, often appearing in the dining hall with wrinkled dresses. Calling Maven over or receiving such friendly looks from Catherine never crossed her mind. The ease with which she could change now was a result of these incidents. After a while, Maven stood in Benzark's room. As soon as he informed Benzark, the Lord looked at Maven with surprise. Lifting his head from his documents, he stared directly at Maven. So, that woman wanted my clothes? He asked with evident interest. Yes. If it was still bright out, I would have left to purchase dresses, but she currently has nothing to wear. Maven began explaining. Benzark set down his papers and pen. Hmm, but why does it have to be my clothes? Rather, tell her to find a maid of similar size and wear their clothes. Benzark calmly suggested, joining both his hands together and placing them in front of him. My lord, we can't have that. Maven's eyes sparked with intensity. He couldn't fathom his lord's suggestion, comparing Lady Adeline with a lowly maid. Maven shouted loudly, passion fueling his words. You shouldn't even joke about something like that. Having Our Lady wear a servant's clothes is extremely, extremely insulting. Maven's anger was palpable, his breaths heavy. Ben Zark, sighing, resumed his work, seemingly unfazed by Maven's continuous protests. So she can't wear that, but she can wear mine? It's men's clothes, Benzark inquired, not appearing too pleased. You know what they say, right? A married couple are one in mind and body. Maven chuckled, delivering the response. Now standing there shyly, Benzark set aside his pen and papers, his mind wandering. He looked at Maven with an embarrassed expression. This cheeky little... It felt like just yesterday when he couldn't look me in the eyes. Nowadays, not only does he talk back to me, he even tries to lecture me. Ben Zark pondered with a tinge of embarrassment, while Maven continued to grin mischievously. Suddenly, Ben Zark found himself wondering how Adeline would look wearing his clothes. His mind wandered, imagining Adeline adorned in his attire. The mere thought made his heart flutter. It might be nice to look at, he concluded, smiling to himself but refraining from expressing it in front of Maven. As soon as Adeline received the clothes from Ben's Ark, she infused her unique style into the outfit. Catherine was the first to witness her in the new attire. Whoa! Milady, really? Catherine began with genuine joy. It suits you so well. You look like a young nobleman. Catherine effusively praised Adeline, who indeed looked stunning in the ensemble. Really? Thank you. Adeline chuckled, savoring the princess treatment. Let's hurry to the dining room. We've already been delayed a lot. Adeline remembered her hunger and started walking down the corridor. Yes, your grace. Catherine followed her in an instant. In the hallway now, the night moonlight was filling everything with its brightness. Catherine confidently led the way, and Adeline walked behind her, exuding a newfound confidence. Even if she didn't tailor the clothes herself, having someone who tailored them to her size felt like a refreshing change. Tasks that she once had to handle on her own could now be delegated to others. While it initially felt a bit strange, Adeline found the experience to be surprisingly liberating, similar to the relief she felt when removing a suffocating corset. She realized she liked this attire more than she had anticipated and contemplated dressing like this more often while touching her collar reveling in the newfound ease of breathing. 
Upon reaching the dining hall, Maven eagerly opened the door, flooding the room with light and the tantalizing aroma of delicious food. Ah, you've arrived! We just finished our preparation dash. Maven's joyous expression faltered as he caught sight of Adeline's getup. His eyes widened in praise. Adeline, you're much, much more handsome than I thought. Even more than Aster! He exclaimed with genuine joy, looking at Adeline with happiness. Maven, is Aster the first person that comes into your mind when you think of someone handsome? Not the Duke? Adeline smiled and asked, her expression thoughtful. Come on, I don't even need to say anything about his grace. He's handsome, but it's his mouth that's the problem, but still. Aster has a somewhat princely charm? Maven began explaining. Adeline nodded in understanding. You could say that he's the stereotype of what a handsome man looks like. He's a bit of a different type from his grace. Maven added, attempting to defend Aster's distinctive charm. A.A.S. had that sort of mood about him. I don't think I've ever thought A.A.S. was handsome. Adeline wondered aloud, marking another amusing defeat for Maven in his persistent efforts to convince her that anyone could be more handsome than Duke Ben Zark. No matter how much I think about it, I can't tell at all, she murmured, contemplating the elusive quality of attractiveness. Adeline, I have a question you obviously think that our lord is the most handsome, right? Maven chuckled, teasing her. Clearly bothered by this sudden comment, Adeline shot him an angry look. Are you making fun of me, Maven? She asked, rolling her eyes. Come on, there's no way I would. Maven laughed attempting to ease the tension. Whatever, who cares if they're handsome or not? The most important thing to me is their wealth. Being rich is the best after all. I think it's important for me to enjoy a lot of things, she declared carelessly, adopting a queenly demeanor. Then, so that you'll look at his grace in an even better light, I will make sure to scold his grace a lot, so that you will be able to enjoy his grace's wealth as you please. Maven obediently pledged, bending in a slightly exaggerated manner. Meanwhile, Catherine pulled out a chair for Adeline, ensuring her comfort. Thank you, Maven. Please do try. Adeline expressed her gratitude to Maven as she took her seat. Catherine ensured the chair was adjusted for her comfort. However, there was a time when Adeline looked at Ray favorably without conditions, and she wanted to tell Maven the truth. But the unavoidable truth was that Ray Benzark was the one who had ultimately ended her life. Though she was able to sit here again, she couldn't escape the feeling of loneliness. She contemplated all of this while absentmindedly moving her fork through the steak on her plate. Suddenly, she stopped, and Maven noticed her hesitation. He wondered if there was something displeasing to her palate. Adeline, is there something that is displeasing to you? If there is, I could request the chef to send out the next course, Maven asked politely. Adeline lifted her head, her face less cheerful this time, and her eyes appeared to have lost their charm. Ah, uh, it's nothing. Thank you for worrying about me. I just had something on my mind. I just wanted to ask, does his grace usually not join for the meal? She inquired, looking around sadly. Eating alone felt somewhat terrifying. Or perhaps it started feeling lonely because it was her second time experiencing everything. This was her second chance at life. No, his grace normally eats separately in his room. Maven forced a smile on his face. Hmm, normally? To me, it feels like you're saying he's normally that kind of person, so please understand and ignore it. Ah, uh, Adeline remarked with a faded smile. I feel embarrassed as a butler. I will correct myself, Maven said nervously. What about? There's nothing that you did wrong, Maven. So please relay this to his grace. In this manner, regardless of whatever he normally did, there exists no reason for me to understand and ignore his actions. Now that he has someone to match with, I would like him to immediately come down to enjoy dinner and conversation with me. And if he chooses to just stay up there and not come down, Please tell him that I'll just starve myself to death. She declared calmly, wearing a determined smile. Adeline put down her fork, fully aware of the gravity of her demand. 
Confidence needed to prevail, and things needed to change this time. In the midst of a quiet evening, Duke Ben Zark found himself indulging in a solitary meal within the confines of his room. The atmosphere was calm until a sudden intrusion disrupted the tranquility. Maven, the bearer of unsettling news, declared with an air of urgency. Lady Adeline said that if you don't go down, she'll starve herself to death. As the words hung in the air, Benzark's hand, poised to take a bite, froze in midair. He raised his head with disbelief, grappling to comprehend the gravity of what he had just heard. Did she really say that? Questioned Benzark, abandoning his fork and clasping his hands together in front of him. Maven affirmed the distressing statement. Yes, I very clearly heard her say kill myself. The weight of Lady Adeline's proclamation lingered, painting a complex tableau of emotions on Benzark's countenance. She really is quite a troublesome woman, sighed Benzark, visibly taken aback by the unexpected revelation. The idea that his newly wedded bride would resort to such extremes left him genuinely surprised. Oh, H. My, at this rate, there are going to be rumors about Duke Benzark starving his new bride. Maven chimed in with a touch of playful concern, subtly nudging and encouraging Ben Zark to descend and share a meal with Lady Adeline. And it would be a shame for the Ben Zark house. That because Duke Ben Zark refused to feed her. His new bride. Maven continued, weaving a narrative that teased at the potential consequences of neglect. Annoyance etched across his face, Ben Zark interjected. All right, I got it. Could you stop lecturing me? He pushed his chair back, signaling his intent to address the situation. Ha! Prepare a meal for me downstairs. He commanded in a firm tone, recognizing the necessity to confront Lady Adeline and clarify the extent of her knowledge about him. This unexpected turn of events not only demanded resolution, but also presented an opportunity to delve deeper into their relationship dynamics. And in an unexpected revelation he found himself not entirely adverse to the prospect. He thought. After a brief interval, they descended to the lower level, Lady Adeline poised in anticipation. The untouched meal before her served as a testament to her anticipation of Duke Benzark's arrival. As he entered, a vivid smile illuminated her face, and she greeted him cheerfully. So you've come. Undeterred, he silently claimed the seat in front of her, choosing not to acknowledge her enthusiasm. Thank you for the clothes. I'll be careful not to ruin them. She extended an olive branch, attempting to initiate a smoother exchange. Her smile persisted, radiating warmth despite his reserved demeanor. H, yes. They fit you well, despite being men's clothes. He responded with an air of nonchalance, seemingly unfazed by the compliment. Is that really your only sentiment? Lady Adeline inquired, her tone turning cold as she locked eyes with him, seeking a more meaningful acknowledgement. You are now my husband, your grace. Shouldn't you at least say it suits me well or that it looks pretty? She pressed further, attempting to convey the desires of her heart, puzzled by his apparent indifference. You're requesting a lot from me, Benzark retorted, maintaining a downward gaze, revealing little about his own sentiments. If you don't like it, should I just return home? Lady Adeline questioned innocently, injecting a note of vulnerability into the conversation. What are you going to do? You're the one that asked me to marry you, remember? If you want to indulge me, you should do it. But I didn't know you were an irresponsible man. She continued, airing grievances and expressing dissatisfaction. Undeterred, she asserted her position with unwavering determination. You keep acting like my wife despite the fact you didn't take my last name. Yeah, I.D. suits you. Benzark conceded, his words laden with a sense of unburdening, as if acknowledging her presence was a begrudging acceptance of a perceived obligation. The complex dynamics of their relationship unfolded, leaving an intriguing narrative of unspoken emotions and uncharted territory. Expressing gratitude for the compliment, Lady Adeline couldn't help but delve into the lingering matter of her not adopting Duke Benzark's name. Leaning forward on the table, she confronted him directly, 
seeking clarity on his thoughts. In response, Ben Zark, seemingly exasperated, rolled his eyes, hinting at a weariness that transcended the current conversation. Is it too late to cancel the marriage now? Ben Zark's rhetorical question carried an undertone of frustration, an expression of being done with the complexities surrounding their union. Haha, ha, IT was just a joke. Shall we eat now? The food will get cold. Lady Adeline attempted to diffuse the tension, directing his attention towards the neglected meal. In that moment, a fleeting thought crossed her mind. Did Ray, her past acquaintance, ever lend her his ear like this? Could a bit of greediness in her desires lead to a more fulfilling connection? I'll call you Ray, she declared abruptly, her tone asserting rather than asking or requesting, marking a shift in their relationship dynamics. Do as you please, Ben Zark responded nonchalantly, engrossed in his dinner. Adeline contemplated the potential nuances of this altered life. It felt different, and she couldn't help but wonder about the unexplored aspects that lay ahead. Then, Ray, try calling me Adele. I'm sure you don't plan on continuing to call me this woman or that woman, right? She playfully suggested a new condition, half expecting resistance. However, to her surprise, Ben Zark set his fork down and sighed. As he began to utter her proposed name, Adeline experienced a sudden flashback of another man desperately extending his hand and calling her name, a memory that seemed to intertwine with the present, adding a layer of complexity to their evolving relationship. As the mysterious silhouette uttered the name, Adele, Lady Adeline's eyes widened and an unexpected wave of emotion swept over her, leaving her pale and momentarily blank. The reality of the present moment only seeped back in when Benzark's concerned voice broke through her reverie. Are you all right? He inquired with genuine concern, prompting her to refocus. I tease nothing. She hastily brushed off his worry, struggling to find an appropriate response to her inexplicable reaction. Gazing at the table, her eyes fell upon the salad, providing her with a convenient excuse. The salad was just so tasty that... She chuckled, placing a hand over her mouth to stifle her laughter, attempting to divert attention away from her momentary lapse. You didn't even eat yet, Ben Zark remarked, rolling his eyes as he delved into his dinner. Adeline, too, tried to regain composure and concentrate on her meal, yet the echoes of that enigmatic voice lingered, leaving her perplexed. What was that voice just now? She pondered, her gaze fixed on the plate before her. The amalgamation of thoughts created a sense of confusion within her. She grappled with the notion that she couldn't have forgotten if Ray had called her name. She held on to the certainty that he had never uttered her name in the past twenty-five years. Despite the fragmented nature of her memories, this much she was sure of. Unable to recall Ray's face, she questioned the intensity of the voice that sounded so desperate. The perplexing nature of the situation left her wondering why these unbidden memories were resurfacing, with only a silhouette and the recollection of his clothes imprinted in her mind. As the night draped the surroundings, Adeline found solace in the garden, silently sipping her tea while gazing at the full moon. Lost in her contemplations, she was startled when Benzark's voice pierced the tranquility. Adele, he called out, prompting her to turn around cup in hand. Are you really going to call me by my name? She queried, uncertainty tainting her expression. You were the one who wanted Teo be called by it. Benzark responded, nonchalantly shrugging his shoulders. Adeline's gratitude surfaced in a warm smile, an unexpected acknowledgement that seemed to catch him off guard. Nevertheless, he composed himself and ambled towards her with hands tucked in his pockets. Regardless, I had something that I wanted to ask. How much do you know about U.S.? He emphasized the word us, injecting an air of urgency into the inquiry, keen on unraveling the depths of her understanding. I know that you are a deva, she replied, exhaling with a hint of resignation, placing her cup down before locking eyes with him. I also know about the war between the heavenly realm and the demonic realm, and that the heavenly realm was defeated. She continued, shoulders shrugging as she shared the fragments of knowledge she held about their celestial reality. The weight of their shared history hung in the air, 
leaving room for more questions and the unexplored intricacies of their intertwined destinies. The backdrop of a heavenly demonic war, an epic that unfolded 512 years ago, beckons the need for elucidation. This conflict transpired within the realm humans dubbed home, the Middle Realm, initially a neutral ground between the heavenly realm and demonic realm. Originally, the Middle Realm served as a haven for the Deva of the Heavenly Realm and the Azura of the Demonic Realm to indulge in their pursuits. However, the sanctity of this neutral ground was shattered when the promise to refrain from invading the Middle Realm was broken. In the ensuing protracted conflict, the Deva succumbed to defeat at the hands of the Azura, with Rey, the Deva's last leader, known as Durlit. This intricate narrative was conveyed to Adeline in her previous life by Ben's Ark. However, the tales she heard were conspicuously silent about Ben Zark himself, leaving her curious about his untold story and yearning to learn more about him. As she gazed at him with a tinge of sadness, realizing the impossibility of unveiling his past, she found herself compelled to resort to a fabrication. I had multiple dreams. Some were clear and some were blurry, she asserted, clearing her throat before commencing her narrative. So that's why I wanted to hear your story. How you were born, how you have lived, and what you wish Tio do. She continued, acknowledging the prior deception while expressing genuine curiosity about Benzark's life. This time, her desire for truth surpassed any pretense, as she earnestly sought to unravel the layers of his existence and comprehend his aspirations. About me? He murmured, and in that moment, the tapestry of his entire existence unfurled before him. All that filled his vision was a dimly lit room, a solitary chair, and a glimpse of brightness beyond the window. Now that he thought about it, he realized that he had never truly contemplated his own identity. His focus had been consumed by evading the gaze of the Azura, surviving the shadows of revenge, and nurturing the desire to seize the tree of life. The past held little significance there wasn't much to discuss. He could recall the relentless war, observing it from a distance while his sole objective remained survival. He simply endured, he simply lived. Amidst this introspective journey, Adeline observed him stealing glances, her patience sustained as she awaited his words. Lost in the recesses of his thoughts, he seemed temporarily detached from the ongoing conversation. I, he attempted to articulate, his voice breaking the silence, leaving an anticipation hanging in the air as he grappled with the complexities of articulating his own narrative. Ben Zark, with a solemn demeanor, commenced sharing a part of his life story with Adeline, revealing aspects he had guarded closely. His revelation began with the profound statement, I was born from the Tree of Life, a few months before the war started. This tree held a significant place in the origin of Devis, divine beings emerging from its colossal branches. Standing with poise, Ben Zark had his arms folded across his chest, a contemplative stance as he delved into the details. In an effort to enrich Adeline's understanding of the Devas, Ben Zark continued, Did you know that Deva and Azura grow up faster than humans? It only takes about three or four months to match the appearance of a five to six-year-old human child. His gaze, unwavering, met Adeline's as he spoke, his intent to educate evident in the firmness of his tone. With a hint of gravity, Ben Zark shifted the narrative to the intricacies of Deva-Jura relations. And that's when the treaty between the Deva and Azura dissolved. They both tried to make the Middle Realm their own, ignoring the rules of the gods. His words carried the weight of historical conflict as he highlighted the deterioration of the once amicable relationship between the Devas and Azuras a pivotal moment marked by the violation of divine rules, where both factions sought dominion over the Middle Realm. In a nuanced explanation, Ben Zark touched upon the perception of Devas and Azuras by humans. The relationship between the Deva and Azura wasn't initially that bad. Since humans worshipped U.S., they classified the white Deva as good and the black Azura as evil. Dot. This classification mirrored the human tendency to simplify complex celestial dynamics, casting the Devas as benevolent and the Azuras as malevolent based on worship patterns. Benzark's revelation unfolded, weaving together elements of celestial birth 
accelerated growth, and the intricate dance between Devis and Azuras in the realm of gods and mortals. However, Ben's arc, with a tone of somber reflection, emphasized the commonality between celestial beings and humans. Our nature isn't any different from humans. We are both good and evil, just like them. That's why sometimes we help them and other times harass them, and even descended to mingle with them as incarnations. He shared insights into the intricate relationship between Devis and humans, detailing how they would occasionally intertwine with mortals, either as children or assuming another human form. A connection forged through worship before the onset of the war. That's probably why we both desired the Middle Realm even more. Benzark's revelation continued, shedding light on the shared aspirations of Devis and Azuras for dominion over the Middle Realm. As Adeline observed, Benzark's voice took on a subdued quality, hinting at the weight of his emotions. Ray, she murmured, acknowledging the evident sorrow in Benzark's narrative. The enormity of his experiences became palpable. The fights were common so we didn't think it would last that long. But the war quickly spread to the Middle Realm, and the Deva started losing. It was because the demon queen Camilla, the Azura's leader, had been preparing for the war all along. They ended up reaching the Heavenly Realm and burned down the Tree of Life, the origin of U.S. The divine power coming from the tree shattered completely. Unable to use their divine power, the Devas lost in no time. In the midst of the war, Ben Zark recounted the pivotal moments of the war, revealing the strategic prowess of Camilla, the Demon Queen. The devastation escalated as the Heavenly Realm fell, and the Tree of Life, the very source of divine power for the Devas, succumbed to flames. The incapacitation of their divine abilities led to the swift defeat of the Devas in the conflict that unfolded. In a poignant recollection, Ben Zark touched upon his own journey remembering how he was designated as the successor by Delat, despite his youth, amidst the tumultuous war. The gravity of responsibility thrust upon him added another layer to the complexity of his experiences. I was designated as Derlet's successor, but before I could receive his teachings, Fabian, the Derlet at the time, died. I was suddenly entrusted with the position of the Heavenly Realm's leader. The Azures kept swarming in to annihilate the Devis, and my companions and family just died helplessly. Benzark's voice quivered as he laid bare the depth of his pain and the profound suffering he endured. The loss of his companions and family in the face of relentless onslaughts weighed heavily on him, the magnitude of the tragedy evident in his recounting. The Devis who managed to survive fell into a deep slumber called tranquility in order to heal their wounds. As the sole survivor, I had to find them in their tranquility. And as a stroke of good luck in the midst of misfortune, the demon queen had also fallen into tranquility. Benzark's narrative continued, revealing a peculiar turn of events amid the chaos. The demon queen's entry into a healing slumber provided him an unexpected advantage, allowing him to conceal his presence while seeking out the surviving Devis. Among those he encountered were A.A.S. and Wacken, compounding the tapestry of his experiences. He nearly choked on his words as he concluded, recounting the arduous journey he and his people faced. Adeline, empathetic and attentive, felt a surge of sympathy for him, her gaze unwavering as she listened intently to his tale. Did you find them in the Middle Realm? Adeline inquired, seeking further clarification. Yes. Since the Heavenly Realm was destroyed, they could only sleep in the Middle Realm. Then this land, the land of darkness, is. Humans abandoned this land, calling it ominous. But thanks to that, ID became a suitable land for us to gather our power. Benzark's response unraveled the connection between the Devis and the Forsaken Land, highlighting the irony that transformed it into a sanctuary for them to regroup and regain their strength. Gesturing towards the encompassing darkness of the land of darkness, Benzark continued his narrative describing the forsaken land as a backdrop to their struggles. The night deepened with each passing second, the untouched teacup standing as a silent testament to the gravity of the conversation. Adeline, her attention undivided, absorbed his words. So in the end, you're trying to take revenge. Adeline's smile bore a subtle pain, 
acknowledging the weight of Benzark's mission. Yes. I'll wake up all of my companions from their tranquility and gather our power once again. In order to kill the demon Queen Camilla. After that, I will retrieve the Tree of Life. Because I need to carry out the Durlet's calling and rebuild the heavenly realm. Ben Zark laid bare his intricate plans, his determination evident in every word as he shared his vision of rescue and restoration. However, in Adeline's eyes, he appeared not as a cold-hearted leader but as a man who, unbeknownst to himself, had endured immense solitude and struggles. Her sympathy for him deepened. You are so brave. Even though you must have been lonely for that long period of time. I'll be on your side from now on, so do not worry anymore. Adeline stood, her cold hand resting on his arm, a gesture of reassurance and solidarity. She sought to comfort Ben Zark, pledging her support. Ben Zark, looking down at her hand on his arm, released a slight tension, allowing her gesture to register. Loneliness, huh? Ben Zark nonchalantly shrugged his shoulders, contemplating the emotion that lingered within him. The revelation of his innermost thoughts to Adeline left him questioning the reasons behind this newfound transparency. Was it the profound sense of loneliness that had prompted him to share his burdens? The cool touch of Adeline's hand seemed to echo the chill within him. As soon as Adeline departed, a profound feeling of helplessness overwhelmed Ben Zark, compelling him to reflect on their conversation. The passing of one month unfolded swiftly marked by the hustle and bustle of maids and servants in the castle corridors. Maven, amidst the commotion, found himself caught up in the flurry of activity. Arg, I'm so busy. H, wait a moment. That tree shouldn't be there, but in the training grounds. Maven's exclamation resonated loudly amid the chaotic sounds, emphasizing the heightened state of affairs. No, please bring that table to the living room. Hmm. Maven directed the servants, pointing towards a wooden table in transit, meticulously managing the castle's logistics. Adeline's numerous orders added to the whirlwind of responsibilities that kept Maven occupied. All right, let's fix the garden first. It's way too dreary. Please hire a gardener. Oh, and an architect as well. Adeline's authoritative commands flowed as she surveyed the landscape from a vantage point in the castle. Maven, dutifully executing each directive, played a crucial role in realizing Adeline's vision for the castle's improvement. The once bustling corridors and rooms now buzz with purpose and activity, a reflection of the changes initiated by Adeline's keen eye for enhancement. Whenever Maven received an order from Adeline, he promptly sought out Ben Zark, who seemed to be operating in an automatic mode, tirelessly repeating his commitment to fulfill Adeline's wishes. The atmosphere conveyed a sense of detachment, as if Ben Zark were indifferent to the ongoing transformations or perhaps found solace in the flurry of activity. Despite the weeks of tireless work, both servants and inhabitants of the castle expressed contentment with the final outcome. The once dreary surroundings now exuded a newfound radiance, adorned with beautiful trees and gardens that captivated the eyes. On the day of the grand revelation, as Adeline admired the lively atmosphere she had orchestrated, a joyful exclamation from the crowd caught everyone's attention. Maven, initially dismissive, soon realized he recognized the voice. Turning around, he was met with a surprising sight. Wow! What's all this? Someone from the crowd expressed astonishment, and Maven, sensing familiarity, couldn't ignore the inkling that he knew the voice. With mixed emotions, he turned around to confirm his suspicion. Huh! Wacken! Maven exclaimed in disbelief. Wacken, a brown-haired individual with a bright smile, stood before him. The unexpected presence of Wacken brought a mix of surprise and joy to the bustling scene. Meanwhile, in the office, Ben Zark and Aster were engrossed in important discussions when the door swung open with a thud. Captain? Did you really get married? Wacken burst into the room, his disbelief echoing through the space. The revelation of Benzark's marital status left Wacken in a state of shock, unable to comprehend the unexpected turn of events. Wacken, still adorned in his cloak with a sword at his back, burst into the room with a furious inquiry. Captain? Did you really get married? 
Ben Zark, momentarily taken aback by Wacken's sudden entrance, shifted his attention from the documents before him to the intense scene unfolding. Yes, Ben Zark replied calmly, resuming his reading. Wacken, in a swift motion, closed the distance and forcefully placed both hands on the table, leaning in with a barrage of questions. What? Why? When? With who? How? Each word carried the weight of Wacken's incredulity, poised to extract answers. Before Ben Zark could respond, Aster, seizing the opportunity, interjected. Because she's a prophet, about a month ago, back when you were stranded in the Frostlands. Her name's Adeline. She's from the Roten family. And do I really need to explain the how part? Aster's mocking tone added a layer of amusement to the revelation. Wacken, infuriated by Aster's interference, shot him an angry look. Shut up and stay out of this. I'm talking to the captain, not you. Wacken's loud retort echoed in the room, emphasizing the singular nature of his conversation with Ben Zark. Ben Zark, a silent spectator, observed the unfolding drama before him. You're not talking to anyone. All you're doing is shouting by yourself. Aster, rolling his eyes, dismissed Wacken's attempts at communication, provoking further fury from the already incensed Wacken. The room simmered with tension as the trio engaged in this unexpected confrontation. I told you to shut up. Why'd you let the captain get married anyway? You should have stopped him. Wacken's frustration erupted in a vehement shout directed at both Ben Zark and Aster. The sense of being left out fueled his anger, compounded by the realization that they proceeded with the captain's marriage without his input or consent. What for? I'm the one who told him to get married in the first place. Aster's nonchalant response, accompanied by a casual shrug, only served to further agitate Wacken. What the hell? Why you? The limits of Wacken's patience were tested as his face turned a fiery red, attempting to restrain his anger and catch his breath. Despite his efforts, he couldn't contain himself, erupting into a tirade. I wanted to be the one to find the perfect wife for the captain. Wacken sought to justify his intense reaction, revealing the depth of his feelings on the matter. If you wanted to do it that badly, then maybe you should have acted a little sooner, huh? Aster's taunting retort further escalated the tension between them, their furious gazes locked in a heated exchange. This is a waste of time. I'm going to see that girl for myself. Wacken, conceding the futility of the argument, abruptly turned away from Aster and Ben Zark, determined to address Adeline directly. The room echoed with the remnants of their conflict as Wacken stormed out, leaving Aster and Ben Zark to process the aftermath of his outburst. He makes a commotion every single time he comes by, Aster remarked, his gaze fixed on the door slammed shut by Wacken. Turning to face Ben Zark, he inquired, Do you think it was all right to let him go like that, Captain? It's fine. Leave him be. Ben Zark responded, a hint of amusement evident as he rested his hand under his chin, accompanied by a subtle grin. His demeanor suggested an eagerness to witness Wacken's encounter with Adeline. But, Aster hesitated briefly, but upon recognizing the true reason behind Ben Zark's smile, he smirked. Well, I guess you're right. After all, even you couldn't do anything about her. This shared amusement hinted at the prospect of Wacken struggling in the face of Adeline's influence. Exactly. Even if we don't do anything, she'll have Wacken wrapped around her finger in no time. Ben Zark declared, finding a certain enjoyment in the unfolding drama. Despite the light-hearted tone, a subtle undercurrent of concern lingered as Ben Zark contemplated advising Wacken to tread lightly. What the hell was Aster thinking? Meanwhile, Wacken, fueled by rage, stormed towards the garden, grappling with the implications of the situation. This is the Durlet's wife we're talking about, he muttered to himself, expressing discontent at being excluded from such a crucial decision. How could he make such an important decision on his own while I was away in the Frostlands? If I find out she's just some common, ordinary woman, I'll kick her out myself. Wacken continued grumbling, the sword on his back nearly touching the ground as he walked with purpose. 
Suddenly, his attention was drawn to Maven and Catherine standing before a lady with her back turned. Unconventionally dressed, her long wavy blonde hair caught Wacken's eye, prompting him to pause behind the bushes, scrutinizing her with a mix of curiosity and determination. The unfolding scene set the stage for a potentially intense encounter. That must be her! Wacken murmured to himself, his attention fixed on the lady with the long wavy blonde hair. Determined to make his presence known, he bellowed. H-E-Y-U. The tone of Wacken's voice caught Catherine and Maven off guard, leading them to hesitate as Maven nervously scratched his neck. Adeline, initially shocked, swiftly composed herself and responded calmly. H-M? Oh, don't be alarmed. I'm perfectly all right. Let's carry on, Adeline assured, her poise unwavering. Turning her attention to Catherine, she instructed. Catherine, go fetch me some cool tea. Projecting her voice for Wacken to hear. Yes, my lady. Catherine acknowledged before disappearing towards the house. Unfazed by Wacken's interruption, Adeline continued. Let's see over there is where we'll have the lilacs planted. The rest can face the opposite direction. Gesturing towards another part of the garden. With Maven by her side, she subtly started walking in that direction. Did she ignore me just now? Wacken, unable to comprehend being overlooked, twitched and flinched with anger. Unrelenting, he shouted once more. H-E-Y. Do you have any idea who I am? Adeline, turning her head slightly, responded with an icy tone. On the contrary, do you have any idea who I am? Are you so foolish as to be rude toward me even after being aware of my status, Wacken? Her cold growl pierced through the air, challenging Wacken's audacity. H, how did you know my... Wacken stuttered before Adeline, with an air of authority, interjected. And oh, more importantly, who are you calling foolish? The confrontation escalated, leaving Wacken momentarily stunned, caught between his stuttered inquiry and Adeline's cutting retort. Answer my question. Do you or do you not know who I am? Adeline's gaze bore into Wacken, her eyes radiating an intense coldness. Of course, your ladyship. You must think you're so high and mighty now, huh? But your marriage doesn't change the fact that you're still nothing but a huma. Wacken smirked as he approached her, the wind hastening around them, causing the trees and leaves to rustle. So, you know I am Adeline Lawton, the wife of Duke Hyrath Benzak. Hyrath Benzak is your master, the one you serve. Adeline enunciated each word with precision, her voice cutting through the air. As Wacken paused near the bushes, Adeline, not one to back down, advanced towards him, causing the grass beneath her feet to rustle. Therefore, when you disrespect me, the wife of your master, you also disrespect him. Or perhaps... That was your original intention? Adeline joyously emphasized her point, stopping in front of the bushes. I would never disrespect Captain. I only. Wacken's flustered response betrayed the impact of Adeline's boldness and remarks. Adeline, rolling her eyes, caught sight of a sword peeking from behind Wacken, its glint capturing her attention. Her eyes widened. That sword. It's the Holy Sword Nicagras. She pointed towards the sword, her words deliberate and measured. H, how do you know about this sword? Wacken, visibly startled, sought answers to Adeline's unexpected knowledge of the sacred weapon. Didn't Aster or Ray tell you? I'm a prophet. Adeline calmly disclosed her true identity. Th, they were telling the truth? Wacken froze in his place, grappling with the realization. You claim to be loyal to your master and yet have no faith in what he says. Adeline sighed heavily, gesturing her head in both directions. She then directed her attention towards the sword. That sword. She pointed at it and continued. It's asleep right now, but I can wake it from its slumber. If I do so, will you accept me as the wife of your master? Adeline posed the question slowly, probing Wacken's allegiance. You can awaken it? Wacken, cautiously intrigued, took hold of the sword and presented it to her. That's impossible. He smirked and elaborated. This sword fell asleep after the tree of life in the divine realm died. 
Unless the tree grows back, IT can't be awakened. So what would a mere human like you be able to do? He raised the sword, expressing skepticism. What have you got to lose by believing me? Besides, that sword must be very precious to you. Didn't IT used to be Commander Fabian's? Adeline shrugged, emphasizing the sword's significance. I lost it. During the war. I only found it again recently. This sword isn't important to just me. It's important to all of U.S. It was our commander's sword. Can you really awaken it? The only reason this sword is in my care is because it's lost its light. If it can regain its former power, I'd like to give it to the captain. Wacken spoke with genuine affection for the sword, expressing a readiness to witness its reawakening. As he raised the sword in front of them, a blue sapphire embedded in it caught the light, adding a touch of mystique to the unfolding scene. So let me ask you again. Can you return this sword to our Delot? Wacken inquired with hope shimmering in his eyes. Of course I can, if that is what you desire. Adeline reached for the sword's handle. However, Wacken, the reason why I intend to wake this sword is because I want you to protect your Delot with it. She held the sword, locking eyes with Wacken, who scrutinized her with intent. So, Adeline placed her finger on the sapphire and began murmuring spells. Wacken's eyes widened as a blue light spread, enveloping the sword suspended in the air. The surrounding environment succumbed to the enchantment, with trees rustling in the powerful wind and Adeline's long wavy hair dancing in the air. The sapphire on the sword started sparkling, signaling its awakening. Wacken couldn't believe his eyes. It's the language of the Devis. How is this possible? She's human, I'm sure of it. What exactly is she? Wacken murmured in disbelief. Wacken, take this sword. It's yours. Can you trust me now? Adeline attempted to hand over the sword with an innocent smile. Despite her stature compared to Wacken, it felt as if he stood before his captain, prompting him to lower his gaze. It is an honor to meet you, Duchess Adeline Benzark. I beg your forgiveness for my rudeness earlier. My name is Wacken H.W.Y.N. I hereby swear to use that sword to protect the Durlet, as you have commanded. Wacken knelt down, seeking forgiveness. Adeline chuckled, radiating warmth. Very good, Wacken. Then allow me to formally introduce myself as well. I am Adeline Lawton. It's a pleasure to meet you, she added with a chuckle. But please call me Adeline. In the aftermath of Wacken's confrontation with Adeline, a palpable tension hung in the air as he hastily made his way back to the office. Benzark and Astor's attentive gazes locked onto him as he barged through the entrance. Captain, Wacken gasped, struggling to catch his breath. Astor, turning with an air of skepticism, inquired, What happened? You've come back somehow looking even more ridiculous than when you stormed off. Did Adeline hit you or something? Astor's words carried a tinge of suspicion highlighting the evident transformation in Wacken's demeanor since his abrupt departure just moments earlier. Benzark, on the other hand, wore a sly grin, adding an intriguing layer to the unfolding scene. It's possible. Benzark retorted cryptically, leaving Wacken bewildered and at a loss for words. The room was enveloped in an uneasy silence, with Astor's probing gaze and Benzark's enigmatic grin heightening the suspense. Do you think he's really all right, Captain? Astor questioned Ben Zark, rolling his eyes in exasperation when Wacken remained mute, seemingly stunned by the recent turn of events. Ben Zark maintained his silence, opting to continue his intense scrutiny of Wacken. Breaking the silence, Wacken suddenly exclaimed, Captain? Look at this! Swiftly, he revealed a concealed sword, raising it triumphantly into the air. The blade emitted a brilliant azure glow revealing a mesmerizing blue sapphire. Aster and Benzark, now rendered speechless themselves, exchanged incredulous glances. How is this possible? Aster voiced his disbelief, reflecting the shared astonishment in the room. The unfolding mystery of the radiant sword added an unexpected layer to the already tense atmosphere, leaving the trio in anticipation of the revelations yet to come. 
That sword! It dash! Ben Zark sprung in place, his words faltering. Yes. The divine sword was still asleep before I went to meet Adeline. But after tapping it a few times, she awakened it. Wacken declared with conviction, his eyes gleaming with an unusual intensity. Adeline did that? Ben Zark questioned, a mixture of disbelief and introspection evident in his tone. She brought it back to life. My first thought was that maybe our tree of life had grown back. But then I realized that you'd be the first to know if that ever happened. And I thought Aster was lying earlier when he said Adeline was a prophet. But after hearing her speak the language of the devas, I had no choice but to believe it. Wacken recounted the events, pulling Aster into the conversation with a deliberate motive, knowing it would provoke him. However, the focus remained on the revelation of the awakened divine sword. You couldn't say that without calling me a liar, could you? Aster, visibly angered, threatened Wacken with a punch, their confrontation overshadowing Benzark's presence. The two locked eyes, a silent challenge brewing between them. What was that? You looking for a fight? Let's go, then. I've got the divine sword now. Wacken taunted, challenging Aster. Like even that could help you. Follow me out to the training hall. We'll see who's the strongest. Aster chuckled and smirked, accepting Wacken's challenge. Meanwhile, Ben Zark, not drawn into their impending clash, remained fixated on Wacken's revelation. Adeline spoke in the language of the Davis? Ben Zark pondered, well aware that humans, in general, could learn the language but were incapable of speaking it. The exception was prophets. Adeline, his wife, was a prophet. Despite this knowledge, a sense of unease settled within him as thoughts of Adeline occupied his mind. In the garden downstairs, Adeline stood frozen at the precise spot where Wacken had left her, her thoughts deeply entrenched in the echoes of her past life. Amidst the reflective tide, a specific recollection surfaced, a pivotal moment when the very sword that had now been awakened was stirred to life by another, Gila. Adeline vividly recalled the scene, Wacken raising the sword, and Gila, through a touch, invoking its power, leading Wacken to kneel in reverence. The corridor bathed in an ethereal blue glow, with Aster and Ben Zark rendered speechless by Gila's presence. In the shadows, Adeline found herself reduced to a spectator, tears streaming down her face. In the past, Gila was the one who awakened that sword. But this time, she was the one who did it. Adeline contemplated, admitting a subtle sense of astonishment at her own unexpected success. Her amusement manifested in a soft chuckle as she observed her hand radiating with magical energy. The realization of her latent powers left her both intrigued and cautious. Surrounded by the bustling activity of servants in the garden, Adeline cast a sidelong glance, recognizing the need for discretion. The revelation of her abilities, particularly in front of Wacken, had evidently shocked even him. Recollecting her past life, Adeline acknowledged Aster's teachings in magic, a skill she honed diligently, allowing her to wield magic effortlessly without the need for incantations. She reminisced about those dedicated years of practice, culminating in the day she mastered simple spells. The memory of that achievement spurred her to run through the corridors and, with her newfound powers, successfully halt Duke Ben Zark in his tracks. As Adeline navigated the delicate balance of concealing her abilities and harnessing them, a newfound sense of responsibility took root, guiding her steps in this intricate dance of past and present. Wait, your grace! Adeline held his arm, eager to showcase the magic she had learned for Ray, a skill she had never had the chance to display in his presence. Her desire to demonstrate her capabilities and the extent to which she could contribute to their world prompted her to offer a small exhibition. With a flicker of her practiced magic, a cup of tea materialized on a plate with a spoon. Yet, her excitement quickly dissipated when she unintentionally spilled the contents of the cup. W what do you think? I can use simple magic like this instantly now. I don't. Adeline began enthusiastically, her joy abruptly stifled by Benzark's cold voice. Make sure you never use that power in front of others. Benzark asserted his silhouette blurring as tears welled in Adeline's eyes. 
Shocked and disheartened, she struggled to recall Benzark's expressions from her hazy past memories. You excuse me? Adeline flinched, seeking an explanation, but Benzark remained silent. Why? A cascade of questions lingered on her lips, but her head hung low as tears streamed down her face. From that day forward, she refrained from showcasing her magical abilities in the presence of others. Reflecting on the incident, Adeline realized that the magic she employed wasn't particularly complex. The issue lay in her ability to wield it effortlessly without reciting an incantation. Contemplating a solution, she pondered the idea of pretending to recite incantations whenever she employed magic, surmising that if it posed a problem then, it likely remained a concern now. The incomplete nature of her memories left her yearning for a clearer understanding of Ray's reaction during that pivotal moment. Was it truly anger? For some reason, she felt as though it wasn't anger, but worry. She pondered this thought with a tinge of sadness, delving into the complexities of emotions. Your Grace, would you like for us to place the tea table over here? Rebecca's loud call abruptly brought her back to reality. Adeline turned towards the bushes where Rebecca and the others stood, having set up the entire tea table. Grateful for the distraction, she walked towards them and took her seat. The manor has gotten livelier with you here, my lady. Rebecca exclaimed cheerfully while wiping off a cup. Everyone's been overjoyed with the change, she added, further emphasizing the positive impact Adeline had made. I'm glad to hear it. Adeline chuckled, appreciating the warmth in Rebecca's words and the compliment. Is it true that they're building a training hall over there? Rebecca inquired with curiosity, prompting Adeline to respond excitedly. Yes. I'm planning on recruiting some new knights to assist Duke Ben's arc. Adeline confirmed, her anticipation for the developments in the manner evident in her enthusiastic tone. The prospect of the training hall and the recruitment of new knights signaled a positive shift in the dynamics of the estate, and Adeline couldn't help but look forward to the changes taking shape under her influence. You have so many wonderful ideas, my lady, Rebecca remarked, placing the cup on the plate with a clink sound. Considering what little there was for Adeline to do in her past life, she had a lot of time to think, though she couldn't exactly share that with Rebecca. I intend to learn swordsmanship from Wacken as well. Adeline responded calmly as Rebecca poured tea into the cup. You, your grace? Rebecca was stunned, unable to speak further. Adeline smiled sweetly, nodding her head. Excitedly closing her eyes, she put her hands under her chin. Why, of course. I've always dreamt of wielding a powerful sword and becoming the greatest knight in the world. If I have whack and teach me, perhaps I can finally make that dream come true. She continued, her voice rising with excitement. Rebecca chuckled at Adeline's passion. Ha ha! I didn't know you had such a playful side, my lady. Rebecca thought it was a jest, but Adeline was serious. She needed to learn swordsmanship to better conceal her ability to use magic instantly. Adeline sipped tea peacefully, contemplating the necessity of finding a powerful sword that wouldn't arouse suspicion. A memory flashed of Ben Zark holding a sword, shielding her on a snowy day. She resolved not to hide behind his back again. Though I do mean it when I say I want to become strong. I want to be so powerful that I'll never be swayed by anyone. Adeline declared passionately. I'm not sure I entirely understand your concerns, my lady, but you shouldn't worry, Rebecca reassured, unable to grasp the full context but offering agreement nonetheless. Even as you are now, I don't think you'd be swayed by anyone. You're the strongest person I know, my lady, Rebecca complimented sincerely, smiling at Adeline. Ha ha, I see. Thank you, Rebecca. Adeline's cheeks flushed with gratitude for the supportive words that resonated deeply within her. In her recollections, Adeline found herself at the center of a heated discussion, subjected to disdainful glares from those around her. Do we really have to take that girl with us? Did you forget that the captain almost died because of that girl? Aster expressed strong displeasure at the prospect of bringing Adeline along on their trip. We're bringing her with us. Ben Zark asserted, advancing toward the door without acknowledging Adeline. 
Despite his lack of acknowledgement, his directive seemed to shield her from the harsh words. Captain? Aster shouted, turning to give Adeline a disdainful look. Tisk! he added, rolling his eyes. Tears welled up in Adeline's eyes as she felt the weight of their collective disapproval. She felt utterly useless to them. Even Hela, echoing Aster's scorn, followed Ben's arc without a second glance. Adeline grappled with her embarrassment, wondering why Ray continued to include her when no one expected anything from her. Ray, she murmured sadly, gazing at the closed door. The memories flooded back, reminding her of the nights when Ben Zark interrogated her. What did you find out today? Ben Zark would question her, hoping for answers. However, Adeline, feeling helpless, could only kneel on the floor in front of him, remaining silent. In moments of quiet reflection, Adeline often found herself shedding tears, grappling with the frustration of not uncovering any information. Today was no exception, she had no answers, no reply. Doubts about her ability to truly aid Ben Zark weighed heavily on her, leading to intense bouts of tears. Those days felt like recurring nightmares, haunted by the inability to contribute. Abruptly, she awoke, drenched in sweat, realizing she had merely dreamt a haunting flashback from her past life. The jarring reality struck her. Perhaps it was a repercussion of the Wacken incident. Regardless, she wondered how long it would take for her to become desensitized to these memories, questioning the duration needed to prove her usefulness and dispel her worries. Clenching her fists to regain composure, Adeline pondered, How long will it be before I grow numb to this memory? How long will I have to prove my usefulness to erase my worries? Sighing and rolling her eyes, she recognized the stark difference of her current surroundings, no longer confined to the shabby room of her past life. Now, in a luxurious room fit for a duchess, Adeline no longer faced nightly interrogations by Ray. As she strolled barefoot towards the balcony, adorned in her nightgown, the moonlit room presented a stark contrast to her previous life. Despite the positive changes, a lingering loneliness persisted. On this particular night, with Ray absent, Adeline gazed at the moon, thinking of him. Her sad eyes spoke volumes her heart couldn't express leaning on the railing. She lifted her head to the sky, watching petals from nearby trees gently descend. In the midst of conflicting emotions, she admitted her hatred and disdain for Ben Zark, wishing her heart could forget him entirely. After two months of dedicated work, the castle Adeline was overseeing was finally completed. Ben Zark, accompanied by Aster and Wacken, visited the finished structure. Wow, how in the world did the building get built within two months? What did they say they would use this building for? Aster couldn't hide his shock, eagerly questioning Ben Zark, who was equally perplexed. Wacken, displaying a silent awe, meticulously surveyed the entire building with his sword still hanging on his back. Captain, did Adeline not explain? You don't know. Aster asked Ben Zark, taken aback by the lack of information. Ben Zark remained silent, unable to find words to explain the swift construction. I think it would be quicker to just ask Adeline nowadays, Aster remarked, rolling his eyes upon realizing that even Ben Zark was at a loss for words. If this continues, we might end up calling Adele the captain instead. Well, Adele is indeed a captain since she's the captain's wife. Wacken commented, accompanied by a thoughtful sigh. What's with the compliments so suddenly? Aster eyed Wacken suspiciously. Before they could delve further into the matter, Adeline's voice came from behind. That is the new dormitory for the knights we will be hiring. She replied, addressing their uncertainties. Unbeknownst to them, she had utilized magic to expedite the construction, a detail she chose not to disclose. A dormitory? Our night order is not large enough to manage a dormitory, Aster questioned, folding his arms across his chest. Besides Deva, we'll be using mercenaries in order to augment the night order, Adeline calmly explained, standing next to Ben's ark. Hmm. Aster, still in shock, sought clarification, momentarily forgetting Adeline was present. Captain? What sort of bullshit is this? He exclaimed loudly, catching Adeline completely off guard. 
I don't remember receiving any reports. Ben Zark, flustered by the unexpected revelation, struggled to recall any such discussions. His murmurings were audible, prompting Adeline to roll her eyes. There is no way that's true. There is no way that I would decide on something so critical so haphazardly by myself. I definitely received permission through Maven. How weird. Should we call Maven and ask him? Adeline asserted, adopting a firm tone and suggesting a call to Maven. Ben Zark began to realize she might be right, recalling Maven presenting Adeline's proposals during his autowork mode. CPN. CMT NSM FRBT. Aster, using abbreviations, indicated to Ben Zark to come out and see him for a bit, showcasing his frustration. I'm doomed, Ben Zark thought to himself, recognizing the danger in Aster's expressions and eyes. Adeline, what do you suddenly mean by a knight order? And you're saying it'll be using mercenaries instead of normal knights? You know how rough and rude they are. Wacken, who had silently observed, finally voiced his concerns, drawing everyone's attention. I know, but how long will it be just you three moving around? Adeline's voice reflected genuine concern for their well-being. That's... Wacken attempted to speak but halted. The Deva's numbers aren't much. Not to mention they all entered tranquility, so it would take a while to awaken them. We have to receive the information from the Azura, and we have to awaken the Deva. Adeline explained the complex situation and why she believed this course of action was the best for them. Does that mean that Wacken and AAS have to move alternately every time? Even if we start recruiting normal knights this instant, how many would tread through the forest of darkness to apply? Ben Zark raised a valid point, and Aster, understanding the distinction between normal knights and mercenaries, grasped Adeline's recruitment strategy. Ah, uh, so that's why you are trying to recruit mercenary troops. Aster gasped, clenching his fist in realization. Yes, it's because mercenaries move to follow profit, and I don't think that is particularly bad. Rather, I thought that they are rather similar to us. The fact that they act more and more roughly in order to survive. Adeline, carried away by her emotions, explained her true reason for recruiting mercenaries. Composing herself, she turned to Aster excitedly. So, A.S., please teach them well, she pleaded, sporting a smile that softened her features eliciting a cute response. What? Wait a minute, this suddenly? I've never taught humans before. Aster, startled, almost went into shock. Don't worry, A.S., you will do great. Adeline reassured him, knowing Aster had taught mercenaries in her past life. And what else? She mused, turning toward Wacken and Benzark, who stared at her with bright eyes, silently questioning what about us. Her response was unexpected laughter. Sorry, I didn't mean to laugh, but you both look so much like puppies that I couldn't help it. Adeline tried to cover her smile, responding seriously, though her smile peeked through her lips and eyes. Aster and Wacken went into complete shock, realizing their captain's wife referred to the captain as a puppy. Even the demon king in tranquility would jump at those words. Huhu. I have something else I want to entrust to Wacken. She looked towards Wacken, still laughing with tears. I have something separate that I want to discuss with Ray as well. Luckily, everyone is gathered here. She turned towards Ben Zark and said softly, creating an air of anticipation. She knew they might think she was crazy, but it had to be said today. Clearing her throat, she spoke in a firm tone. I will make a path through the forest of darkness she declared. Adeline? No matter what the forest of darkness is, Wacken attempted to interject. It's not like I don't know the significance, Dash. She began to explain, but Benzar cut her off abruptly, displaying an unprecedented anger. No, he said coldly, his voice filled with anger. As expected, he responded this way. Do you think I would suggest making a path without giving it any thought? She spoke carefully. Even still, you can't. Decorating the main castle, upturning the garden, even building an entirely new military training hall and creating a new knight order, none of that matters. But even if it's you, 
I can't allow you to do this. He grinded his teeth, leaving her uncertain if he was angry or worried. Even if it was her. He was talking about her in that manner because she was a prophet. Did you forget, Ray? I am a prophet. Do you think I wouldn't know that the forests of this land consist of heavenly round plants? She threw her last card. You're planning something so ridiculous even though you already know? He shouted in a louder voice. And how would you know whether it is ridiculous or not before listening to what I have to say? Adeline was worked up, frustrated that Ben Zark was passing judgment before hearing her out. So what I mean is... Ben Zark attempted to speak, gauging her expressions. Ray, I will never do anything that is of detriment to you or the Devis. Do you know why? Adeline softened her voice, causing Ben Zark to flinch. My objective is, within ten years, to grant all of you your desires. I wish to spend the rest of my life on this land, comfortable and well-fed, she calmly stated, leaving everyone speechless. Within ten years, Aster questioned, thinking he misheard. They had assumed everything would take at least two hundred years, but here she was confidently declaring otherwise. If it is me, it's possible, she proudly affirmed, then turned toward Wacken. Therefore, Wacken. Ah, uh, yes, he eagerly responded. Please teach me swordplay from now on, Wacken. It seems I need to protect my doubtful husband myself, she cheerfully declared, glancing at Ben's arc. His face turned red with a mix of anger and embarrassment. Wacken and Aster exchanged glances behind Ben's arc both thinking. The captain will receive protection from Adeline. I'll slaughter you if you laugh. Ben Zark grinded his teeth, warning them, but it was too late. Wacken and Aster burst into laughter, thoroughly amused. Ben Zark stood there silently, watching them make fun of him. Now I think we're all done with the laughing, so will you try listening? I'll tell you why I want to make a path through the forest of darkness and how, within ten years, I will put an end to this war. She requested their attention, binding her hands behind her back and smiling as she spoke. First, I will go to Mavane Island. Adeline began to share her idea, gesturing with one hand on her back and pointing with the other. The sudden shift puzzled everyone. Uh, Adeline, we were just talking about the Forest of Darkness. How did we suddenly get to Mavane Island? Aster asked impatiently wearing a confused expression. Will you be going personally? That place is so far that teleporting won't reach, and it would take over a week to get there, even by boat. Wacken interjected, raising a valid concern. They bombarded her with questions without letting her explain, while Ben Zark silently observed. You are right. I will be going in person, and I am even planning on visiting Mokran City. She replied with a smile. Adeline, that place is... Aster hesitated, warning her cautiously. A vicious city full of awful criminals? She cut him off, answering with a smile. It was more of a question-type response, catching them off guard with her candid opinion. People don't usually make rebuttals with words. Broadly speaking, I have three reasons. I said I would be making a path through the forest of darkness, right? She began elaborating and now all of them concentrated on listening to her. I'm not saying that I will just be making a path. I know the value that the Devis give this forest. The bizarre plants that fill the forest of darkness are actually all plants from the heavenly realm. The plants that originally only grew in the heavenly realm happened to take root in the middle realms, and that was why they were distorted so bizarrely. But the inherent power of the plants did not completely vanish so it acts to protect the Ben Zark Ducal family. If a normal human stepped into this forest, on the other hand, they would be overwhelmed by the plant's energy and die or go insane. We may not be able to block the manifestations of the Azura, but since we can block the avatars of the Azura who borrowed the bodies of humans. She clearly understood very well what they were worried about. Adeline explained everything she had planned for them and the Forest of Darkness. Before the heavenly demonic war erupted, the Devis, who received an ominous prophecy, spread the seeds of the heavenly realm onto this land. 
This was so that, on the off chance that the lands of the heavenly realm were lost, the remaining devis could nurture their power here. I have no plans of opening such an important land so easily. However, I will be making it so that the path will open and close whenever we want it to, and using that, we need to thin out the people who wish to revive the demon king. I'm planning on holding a flashy party. Has it been about 100 years since you, A.A.S. and Wacken, woke up and reclaimed the Horace name? At the end, she looked towards Ben Zark, directly addressing him with this question. Yes, it has. Ben Zark nodded his head. Then doesn't that mean that, right about now, they'll be carefully watching us with the hungry eyes of a tiger, looking for an opportunity to infiltrate these lands? If it's me, I can tell if the person who enters is an avatar of the Azura or not. I can guarantee it. The time when your people will be able to return to their land is not far off. My reasoning for going to Mavane Island is connected to this as well. Even if I understand the theoretical part of it, I need to obtain the materials necessary for making the path. Adeline spoke in a firm tone without any fear, displaying a passion that transformed her into a different person. Must you really go? If it is materials, there should be plenty here. Ben Zark tried to stop her, fully aware she wouldn't easily change her mind. If all of the materials could be found here, I would also want to stay here. She replied with a fake smile, injecting a hint of emotion into her voice. She then shifted her attention towards Aster. But, A.A.S., the food here is awful, right? She chuckled and asked cutely. Aster, caught off guard, blurted out a hesitant. Yes. Ah, uh, no. So what I meant was... Aster tried to explain with embarrassment upon seeing Benzark's cold eyes piercing through him. It's all right. I can already tell from your expressions. It's difficult to hire a chef in a place like this, so I plan to find one while also fulfilling my own plans. There is a special chef that I wish to introduce to all of you, and he lives there. She said with a bright smile, reminiscing about someone she hadn't met in a long time. It was necessary for her to go there and bring him here. Then she continued. Not to mention, oh my! She exclaimed as if she suddenly remembered something. The mercenary troop I wish to recruit just so happens to have a clipper necessary to go to Mavane Island. What should I do? Adeline innocently inquired, focusing especially on Ben Zark. Asta raised his hand to get her attention. Adeline, do you really have to go that far? He seemed genuinely worried. Of course. I've been explaining it to you, but is anything lacking? She shrugged her shoulders. It's about the famous mercenary troop in Mokran City. You can always borrow a ship from somewhere else. They will be extremely vicious people. I don't think any of them are normal. Asta tried to warn her, hoping she might reconsider. However, she smiled and replied confidently. They have to be at that level in order to even dare come into the land of darkness. She blinked her eyes softly and smiled. Judging by their reactions, they'd faint if she told them that she was planning to awaken a sleeping siren. Adeline thought of this but kept quiet, unable to share the full extent of her plans. I also have a reason for wanting to ride that clipper. Instead, she stated firmly, Adeline, it will be difficult for me to answer right away, but you have to think that, once you leave these lands, everyone is an enemy. You are an important person to us, Adele. Aster expressed his concerns as a great friend. That is really nice to hear, but I also have a lot that I entrust to you. Just as I am important as the prophet, all of you are necessary to me, and so I wish to do my best. She replied in a low, firm tone, looking at them as if she was trying to assure them that she could manage it all. She looked directly at Ben Zark, conveying that it would be best if she left it at that for now. This was a relationship of mutual benefits, and she wanted to tell him not to make that sort of expression. She thought he'd turn his back on her again if she became useless to him. This was their relationship. She didn't even hope that they would like her. She thought everything so sadly and was just about to turn around to leave when she heard something unexpected. What are you planning to leave? It was Benzark's voice. She couldn't believe he asked her something. He asked her, 
For what? She was so taken aback. Her eyes widened, hope gleamed in them, and they shined brightly as she turned around to see him. He was looking towards her worriedly. Huh? She murmured confusingly. Captain? Aster tried to call Benzark to stop him from making foolish decisions. Now that he had listened to her reasoning, there was no reason to stop her. So what shouldn't be allowed? If it's dangerous, we can guard her. He replied simply in a strong voice, looking directly at Adeline. He walked towards her and stood in front of her. Even still, I am Adeline. She rolled her eyes. Tis, he clicked his tongue. Yes, Adeline, he murmured, looking into her deep purple eyes with concerns. Please do not click your tongue. She rolled her eyes with carelessness. I understand, Adele, honey. He cleared his throat, finding it difficult to address her affectionately. He blushed hard. I will go with you and listen to everything you want, so don't worry. He tried to calm her down. What? Her eyes widened with surprise. She couldn't say a word anymore. This woman, why was she responding like that when he was saying he will do everything she wants? Why are you reacting, Dash? He asked angrily. As sorry. I never thought that you would tell me that, honey. She apologized as she realized her obsession and tried to respond to him with the endearment. It was difficult for her as well, but she somehow managed to say so. Their eyes met, both blushing so hard that their cheeks were bright red. Aster and Wacken peeked towards each other with a side eye and smiled. Thank you? She looked directly into his eyes and said shyly, Don't be thankful for every little thing. He abruptly turned around to lessen his embarrassment and continued as he walked away. You are the wife of the Duke. You can do whatever you wish, and that is a matter of law. He went inside the house. Wacken and Aster followed him, and she just stood there, looking at his broad back from far away. Can things be slightly different? Was she allowed to expect a tiny bit from him? She thought hopefully, hope shining in her eyes. In the night, it was a house with simple architecture, looking like a residence for middle-class people. Beside the door was a fire pot hanging. Inside the house, a girl with rough clothes and appearance, clothes covered in dirt, and orange-colored hair was bent down over a pot, peering inside. Why? For what reason? Why is it that I cannot see the future of those people? Since when did this change occur? I have to be able to see their futures. She couldn't see the future of Duke Ben Zark, Aster, or Wacken anymore. She couldn't understand what went wrong and where. She was thinking thoughtfully. She definitely saw it before. They were taking her through the forest of darkness. She was in between Aster and Wacken, and Ben Zark was leading the way. She tried everything but nothing worked. She looked inside the huge pot filled with animal blood. The chicken blood doesn't work, and the sheep and goat blood didn't work either. I even tried pig blood. Forget the future, even clairvoyance isn't working. I can see everyone else's futures, but why can't I see theirs? This is a huge problem. At this rate, he will classify me as a useless human. She murmured, trying to figure out what went wrong and where. Ben Zark sat contemplatively in his office, his hand supporting his chin as he delved into profound thoughts, replaying recent events in his mind. Adeline's impassioned outburst echoed. How can you call it insane when you've yet to hear me out? Recollections of Adeline's commitment to realizing his dreams within a decade and embracing a life of opulence lingered in Ben Zark's mind. Astonishment marked his expression as he contemplated her determination to acquire self-defense skills from Wacken, driven by the perceived necessity to safeguard her skeptical husband. The vivid memory of Adeline's surprise at his unexpected agreement to join her replayed in his thoughts. It's just, I didn't expect you'd say something like that to me. She articulated slowly, a moment that remained etched in his memory. Gratitude flowed as she softly uttered. Thank you. Lost in contemplation, Ben Zark failed to notice Aster entering the room after a discreet knock. Aster, assuming an assertive stance, approached Ben Zark's desk with uncertainty. We need to talk, Capt. 
he declared with aggression, expressing concern about Benzark's intentions. Please tell me you're not seriously planning to take Adeline to Mokrin City. Aster pleaded with worry evident in his eyes. Benzark, lifting his head, met Aster's gaze directly and responded calmly. I am. The gravity of the decision hung in the air, leaving an air of uncertainty and concern. Have you lost your mind, Captain? You know how important she is to U.S. Adeline might get hurt in that city or worse, killed. We can't afford to lose her, Aster exclaimed, his concern overriding his awareness of addressing his captain, raising his voice in the process. Aster, Ben Zark retorted, his gaze piercing with coldness, his voice echoing an even colder tone. Do I look that weak to you? Ben Zark questioned calmly, emphasizing each word with deliberate weight. Aster, momentarily taken aback, composed himself to respond. That's not what I'm talking about. You're stronger than anyone I know. But this is different. This involves fighting and protecting someone at the same time, and it's not like Mokrin is your average city. Even the most powerful of nobles hire a multitude of guards to protect them when they travel there. That place is full of kidnappings, robberies, murders, everything. Anything could happen there, and no one would so much as blink. I'm not saying that I don't trust Adeline. I just don't want to take any chances. Go to Mokran City if you must, but don't take her with you. Aster passionately conveyed, articulating the myriad dangers associated with Mokran City, especially for someone as vulnerable as Adeline. But, Ben Zark hesitated, torn between rationality and his commitment to Adeline. Aster's earnest depiction of Mokran City's perils resonated, yet something held him back from rejecting Adeline's desires outright. The internal conflict reflected in his expression as he grappled with the weight of responsibility and personal emotions. Is this because of what Adeline said? Since when did you become so obedient? Last I recall, you excel at ignoring other people's words, Aster challenged aggressively, astonished by Benzark's perceived vulnerability to Adeline's influence. It was clear to Aster that when it came to Adeline, Ben Zark was willing to sacrifice anything and comply with her every request. Ben Zark, in the midst of Aster's scrutiny, found himself questioning his own behavior. Now that he thought about it, he didn't understand either. Somewhere along the way, he started wanting Teo fulfill her every wish, from the most trivial requests down to the most outrageous demands. Why is that? Why is it that every time he looked into those eyes he felt like his body has frozen over? Adeline's innocent face lingered in his thoughts as he grappled with this newfound realization. Aster, Ben Zark murmured, seeking Aster's perspective on the matter. Yes, Captain? Aster responded casually, his demeanor unbothered as he observed Ben Zark. Am I behaving that strangely? Ben Zark queried slowly prompting a shocked reaction from Aster, who couldn't fathom Benzark's self-awareness. I'm glad you're finally starting to notice. Nothing I say is going to stop you, is it? I noticed that you've been changing. I've just kept quiet about it until now because I think it's a good thing, Aster admitted, expressing contentment with Benzark's transformation while cautioning him to tread carefully. We have Melda and scrolls in the shed. Change them into magic stones and take them with you. We have more than enough. Something tells me we'll be using them a lot more from now on. Aster smoothly transitioned to practical matters, offering valuable advice on preparations for the journey. Benzark, appreciating the guidance, nodded in acknowledgement. As Aster prepared to leave, Benzark called out. Aster. What? Anything else you want to add while we're at it? Aster, rolling his eyes, inquired sarcastically. Thank you. Ben Zark expressed gratitude, surprising Aster with this unanticipated gesture. I never expected Tio hear those words from you, Aster admitted, genuinely taken aback by the change in Ben Zark's demeanor. Well, it's nice to see how much Adeline has changed you already, but don't expect me to say you're welcome. Or did you want me to get all sentimental too? Aster, attempting to mask his own surprise, made a light-hearted comment before leaving the room. I'm heading out now. 
I need to continue preparing the mines so we can dig up more melded to sell. In the meantime, you can teach Adeline more magic or something. Aster teased, enjoying the evident flustered state Benzark found himself in whenever Adeline's name was mentioned. All right. Benzark responded with a wry smile, acknowledging the playful banter while understanding Aster's intentions. The dynamic shift in Benzark's demeanor reflected the profound impact Adeline had on him, creating a unique and captivating transformation. Adeline strolled through the hall with Catherine, glancing out the window and sensing the chill in the air. It feels a little cold today, she remarked, her loosely tied hair cascading as she wore a long coat. It's already December. Wouldn't IT be best to wear warmer clothes from now on, my lady? Catherine expressed concern, though she herself only had a scarf, clearly insufficient against the cold. No, this coat is enough for me. I'm more worried about you. Aren't you cold? Adeline inquired, genuine worry evident in her voice as she observed Catherine's attire. Oh, I'm all right, my lady. Catherine reassured attempting to downplay her discomfort with a mere scarf, lacking a better option. I'll buy you a coat just like mine and send it to you later. I can't have the people I care about getting cold. Adeline offered warmly, a smile accompanying her caring words. Your grace. Catherine responded, flustered by Adeline's thoughtful gesture, feeling understood on a deeper level. Wacken and Maven approached, Maven greeting Adeline enthusiastically. Hello, Adeline. Are you ready for your trip? Wacken followed behind, appearing less enthusiastic and more compelled. Realizing Adeline's attention on him, Maven explained, Oh, I called Wacken here to help carry your luggage. I'm afraid I'm too frail and delicate to carry anything too heavy. Chuckling at his own admission. Delicate? More like weak. Try exercising more. Wacken retorted his eyes rolling aggressively as he taunted Maven. You seem to be forgetting that I'm just a fragile, ordinary human. Maven countered with a verbal jab, attempting to hold his ground against Wacken's teasing. The banter between the two added a touch of humor to the atmosphere, creating a light-hearted moment amid the preparations for Adeline's upcoming journey. Not everybody's as strong as you, you know. Maven added, acknowledging Adeline's strength. Adeline, Maintaining her silence, continued to observe Maven, her mind preoccupied with a deeper reason for their swift departure. The reason as T.O. why she was having them leave in such a hurry was because of Marvin. I and Adeline's past life, they went to Mavane Island not for materials, but T.O. killed demon beasts. The awakening of demon beasts is a sign that the demon king's power is growing stronger. Unless things have changed from her past life, the sirens will wake up in the year 517. But they can't afford Teo wait that long, because Marvin, who went along with Aster on the expedition Teo killed the sirens, died in that battle. That's why Adeline need Teo take care of the sirens now, while they're still dormant. Don't worry, Marvin. I'll protect you. Adeline abruptly shifted from her contemplative state, determination evident in her words as she reassured Marvin her attention focused on his innocent face. You seem to enjoy saying that, Adele. Is protecting people your hobby or something? First it was the captain, and now it's Marvin. Wacken questioned thoughtfully, hands supporting his cheeks as he observed Adeline. Adele. I didn't realize I looked that weak to you. I do know how to take care of myself, you know? It's just that everyone around his grace is freakishly strong. Maven continued, tears betraying a sense of disbelief at Adeline perceiving him as weak. The complexity of relationships and individual strengths within their group unfolded in this moment of introspection and revelation. Ha, sure. Just focus on hiding if anything happens, all right? Wacken taunted Maven, eliciting an angered response. Humph. Talking with you is like talking to a wall. Maven retorted angrily lifting his suitcase and storming towards the stairs, visibly upset. Great. Now he's all pouty, Wacken remarked, rolling his eyes at Maven's departure. Stop teasing him. I know how much you like him. Adeline intervened, smiling at Wacken. Who, me? 
Wacken feigned surprise at the unexpected revelation. Yes, you. And if you keep acting like that, you might come to your regret it later. Adeline warned calmly, her words carrying a depth of insight. Flashbacks of Maven's tragic death played in her mind, a scene where Wacken held Maven's lifeless body by the sea, shouting in anguish. Adeline was determined to prevent such a fate from recurring. Well, enough of that. What was the name of the band of mercenaries you planned to meet anyway? Wacken shifted the topic, attempting to conceal his emotions. Oh, did I forget to mention that? Adeline responded with surprise, walking behind him. They're called the Legion of Eagles, otherwise known as the Black Wind. She disclosed in the hallway, revealing the identity of the mercenaries they were about to engage with, introducing an element of intrigue and anticipation to their impending encounter. It's the Eagle Mercenary Corps. They are also known as the Black Wind, Adeline calmly revealed. Wacken, taken by surprise, turned towards her with a mix of curiosity and concern. Adeline, do you realize what kind of people the Black Wind are? Wacken asked with astonishment, clearly startled by Adeline's choice of mercenaries. Of course I do, Adeline replied calmly, continuing to walk past Wacken without a backward glance. Then you must also be aware that they partake in cruel human trafficking. Wacken almost raised his voice, expressing genuine worry for Adeline. Yes, I am aware. Adeline reiterated, maintaining her composure and steadfast pace. Yet you're still saying that you're going to them? Wacken questioned with a tinge of anger, feeling disappointed in Adeline's decision. I feel like Ray, you, and A.S. sometimes treat me as some child. Adeline's voice turned cold without facing Wacken. She continued, That's not what I'm saying, but it's really dangerous. Wacken attempted to clarify but Adeline misinterpreted his words. So what? Are you going to make me hide behind you every single time and tell me to stay away from my business because it's dangerous? Yes, I'm sure you are worried because I am the important prophet. If you did it once or twice, I could understand it being the result of your worries. However, I'm not a doll that moves as you please. Adeline turned around abruptly, expressing her frustration and anger. You asked me earlier if my hobby was to protect people, right? Adeline inquired calmly, cutting off Wacken's attempt to respond. I know, I must look extremely small and weak in your eyes. I must look like I can't even lift a single sword. However, please remember that I'm the person who returned the light to that sword. She pointed towards the sword. Please remember that I also have the power to protect somebody, and because of somebody... I got sick and tired of doing nothing while hiding behind people's backs. That's why I'd like you to understand me, got it? Adeline explained, concluding with a grin that conveyed a mix of determination and assurance. Wacken remained silent, indicating that he understood. Later that day, they teleported to Makran City. Blue magical lines, light, and spells carried them through the teleportation medium, depositing them at their destination. As they set foot on the ground, Benzark turned towards Adeline with worry, asking, Are you okay? Yes, I'm perfectly fine. Adeline chuckled, adjusting her clothes with a sense of confidence. I did hear about it, but she's really fine. Wacken pondered silently as he observed Adeline. He chose not to say anything further, having heard that it was her second time teleporting. It's way easier than when I used it the first time. Adeline commented to Ben Zark, who nodded in acknowledgement. Adeline recognized the importance of getting accustomed to teleportation, a skill she anticipated using frequently in the future. Despite Wacken's doubtful gaze, her resolute voice echoed in his mind. Please remember that I also have the power to protect somebody. It's natural that she got angry. She's the prophet, after all. Even though IT wasn't Wacken's intention... He was looking down on Adeline. Wacken contemplated, acknowledging the weight of Adeline's role as a prophet. Although humans worship Deva and Azura as gods, the actual god is another existence. And the prophet is the person who was bestowed with God's authority. The power of prophecy is God's power, and while Deva and Azura use the mana coming from the tree of life, 
IT is still an extremely rare occasion for them to see a prophecy. It must be because she is a prophet that she can teleport so easily. Wacken marveled at the significance of Adeline's abilities, feeling grateful for her connection with the captain. Wacken felt so pleased that he wanted to thank Adeline for marrying the captain. As Adeline and Ben Zark walked away, engrossed in conversation, Wacken gazed at their backs with genuine happiness. They truly made a great couple, a fact that brought a sense of joy to Wacken. Meanwhile, Adeline continued to walk ahead, and Ben Zark followed behind, fixated on her. Ben Zark was looking at her back, now certain that he was not currently eye in his sane mind. Conversations with A.A.S. had only confirmed that he had become a fool when it comes to matters related to her. No, he might always have been an idiot to begin with, which explained why he kept thinking that Adele is beautiful, even at this moment. Adeline's hair fluttered in the air, adding to her allure. What a pathetic guy. Can I still call myself Derlet? Ben Zark mumbled, attempting to pull his mind from these thoughts. Suddenly, due to a strong wind, Adeline's hair ribbon came undone and flew towards Ben Zark. In the midst of his contemplations, he instinctively snatched it. Meanwhile, Wacken looked at Adeline with great admiration, appreciating having such a cool duchess. Adeline, noticing their reactions, turned around, feeling flustered, finding both of them looking at her like fools. She was not sure what's going on with those two but, due to teleportation, she felt like throwing up after all. The sensation of teleportation left her queasy, and as she reached Ben Zark, she retrieved her ribbon from his hands. They exchanged confused looks, both struggling to comprehend their own feelings. The misunderstandings between Ben Zark and Adeline seemed to be deepening, adding a layer of complexity to their relationship. Despite the confusion, the three of them continued walking through the silent forest, with the wind gently blowing and leaves rustling along with their footsteps. By the way, orcs apparently appear around here. I heard they often attack people since monsters used to live in this forest. Certainly they are a lot more vigilant than the other cities. Right, so... Wacken expressed his concern, hesitating as he didn't want to incur Adeline's disapproval again after she had made it clear that she could take care of herself. Adeline smiled at Wacken, fully understanding his thoughts. She appreciated the concern and contemplated whether she should at least pretend to listen to him, even if she wouldn't follow his advice. Of course, haha, you were going to tell me to hide behind Wacken or Ray if it gets dangerous, right? Thank you for worrying about me, Wacken, she said politely to cheer him up. Ben Zark, seemingly absorbed in walking, was actively listening to their conversation. Adeline's words made him ponder if she likes it when others worry about her. Ben Zark, immersed in his own thoughts, became serious. He decided that next time he'll be the first one to worry about her, acknowledging the evolving dynamics and realizing the importance of his own role in Adeline's life. H, we arrived while we were chatting. We've arrived, Adeline. It's Mokran City. Wacken shielded his eyes from the sunlight, attempting to get a good view and signaled their arrival. As they entered the city, a vibrant hustle and bustle surrounded them, with people chattering in the lively bazaar. Come to the Mayho Inn. There's an excellent bath. You can stay for a cheap price. Our comfortable beds are peerless, a man enthusiastically touted. Come and have a meal. Mokran City's specialty soup is free. Another man joined in, trying to attract attention. They are touting a lot. Adeline exclaimed excitedly, catching the lively atmosphere. Ben Zark turned towards her. There are lots of mercenaries and tourists since it's that kind of city. Ben Zark attempted to sound cautionary. I see. I can't understand why you didn't want to allow me to come here when there are this many tourists. Adeline rolled her eyes, playfully challenging Ben Zark. I agreed, he replied with a hint of jealousy, wondering why she never spoke to him politely. I'm thankful for that. Adeline shrugged her shoulders, her casual response eliciting a groan from Ben's arc. The situation reminded her of the past, prompting her to consider asking him more questions and continuing the conversation, even though she already knew their answers. 
I understand why there are lots of mercenaries, but it's rather unexpected that there are so many tourists. Adeline inquired, feigning surprise. It's because there's not many taxes here, and expensive items get traded for cheap prices. There are lots of arenas and gambling houses. So many people come to visit to experience them. Ben Zark calmly explained, walking through the city with her. Adeline looked at him with affection, realizing that she used to think he felt annoyed about explaining stuff to her, but now he seemed to be enjoying it. That's why people who are looking for cheap items. He continued explaining, but Adeline was lost deep in her own thoughts, acknowledging her previous misunderstandings. I see. She murmured while looking at him, reconsidering her assumptions. Suddenly, pages fell in the air, and a guy shouted for people's attention. The strongest gladiator! The great thief of hell is participating! Ben Zark raised his hand and caught the fluttering paper. He read out the content, while Adeline looked at him silently. H. So there was another reason why the street was so noisy. Indeed. Mokrin at this time of the year is always noisy with this. It's the first time Adele has seen this, right? Wacken, holding a paper as well, inquired Adeline about the gladiator contest. Adeline raised her hand and held the paper too, reading it out. It looks like they were holding Mokrin's specialty, the gladiator contest. The Great Thief of Hell. It was tomorrow. The matches were tournament style and you can bet on the person you think will win and earn money if you guess correctly. She have already experienced the past, which means she already know the results of the matches. She remembered what the Eagle Mercenary Corps leader said I in her previous life. She was sure he said the great thief of hell lost because of a stupid mistake. She remembered it because he complained so much about the host being the only one that benefited from it, and she also know who is going to win this tournament. Ben Zark saw her lost in thought and leaned towards her. Ray, he murmured. What's up? He asked her politely. Do you want to earn some money tomorrow? She raised her head and smiled brightly towards him, revealing her knowledge of the upcoming events. Wacken, do you believe Adeline truly indulges in watching gladiator contests? The upcoming match promises to be exceedingly brutal, he inquired, still clutching the banner. Ben Zark observed silently, letting the conversation unfold. Adeline, seemingly unfazed, responded, I'll be fine. After spending a considerable amount since arriving at the manor, I aim to accumulate some funds this time. She chuckled, envisioning the myriad ways she could enhance the estate, from garden embellishments to interior redecoration and the construction of a new dormitory. Intrigued Wacken Probe Ah, uh, are you contemplating purchasing tickets for the contest? Adeline, with a sly smile, remarked, I have a keen eye and can discern the potential winner at a glance. If you find yourself uncertain, feel free to seek my insights. Wacken, seizing the opportunity to boost his ego, failed to recognize that he was addressing the prophet herself. Ben Zark merely rolled his eyes at the display. With chest puffed and hand on his heart, Wacken proudly declared, if you're unsure about whom to bet on, just consult me. The realization of addressing the prophet dawned upon him, causing embarrassment as Benzark's disapproving gaze intensified. In a sheepish tone, Wacken admitted, Hmm, I'm considering choosing the same contender as Adeline. The boastful facade crumbled, leaving him on the verge of tears. Turning her attention to Benzark, Adeline inquired, Ah, uh, does Ray want to try his luck as well? Ben Zark, with a pensive expression, scratched his chin and murmured, Hmm. What exactly is a contest ticket? Ben Zark queried, his question dripping with embarrassment. Wacken and Adeline stood frozen, wide-eyed, caught off guard. Breaking the silence, Wacken couldn't comprehend how someone with Ben Zark's extensive life experience remained oblivious to the concept. Captain, you've lived for five hundred years, and you seriously don't know what a contest ticket is? Wacken expressed disbelief. Adeline's eyes echoed the sentiment. The awkwardness lingered until Ben Zark chuckled lightly and admitted, It's because I didn't have time for useless things. Grinding his teeth at Wacken. Betting isn't useless. 
It's akin to a desperate fight for life and death. Wacken exclaimed, shocked at Benzark's ignorance. Unconvinced, he shouted. Why would something like that be life and death? Do you have too much stamina or something? Benzark, nonchalantly, started walking, with Wacken and Adeline trailing behind. Captain doesn't understand romance. It's romance. Learn to live life, Captain. Wacken continued his banter. Adeline stole a glance at Ben Zark, sensing a subtle hint of upset in his expression, or perhaps it was just her imagination. Meanwhile, Ben Zark remained engrossed in conversation with Wacken. Use that strength to work harder on your mission. Ben Zark advised seriously as they reached a stopping point, prompting Wacken to begin his explanation. In essence, it's a gamble. Tomorrow, the notice board will display information about the participating gladiators, and we simply need to predict the winners of each match and place our bets, Wacken succinctly explained to Ben Zark. The crowd gathered around the board, eagerly studying the list of fighters. Hmm, which means popular gladiators will have a lower dividend rate, and the unpopular ones will yield a higher dividend in return. Ben Zark mused, making his own assumptions. His gaze then shifted towards Adeline, a smile playing on his lips. I'm guessing there's another reason why you're trying to make money, he intimated, locking eyes with her as if revealing that he understood her intentions. As expected of the captain, Ray is quick on the uptake. Adeline laughed, her closed eyes emitting an air of genuine joy. The atmosphere seemed to blossom with imaginary flowers falling around them. Adeline couldn't fathom what was happening. Were Ray's expressions ever that warm in her previous life? Benzark, seemingly approving yet cautionary, flicked her forehead. Adeline closed her eyes, processing the unexpected gesture. We have more than enough money to use, even if you don't do something like that. He nonchalantly remarked, leaving Wacken wide-eyed at the unexpected generosity. Adeline, still in shock from the forehead flick, quietly observed him. Ben Zark, revealing a smirk, shared a past anecdote. There used to be a human named Balan. He liked gambling, and I picked him up and raised him because he ruined himself and his family. Yet, he kept spending money on gambling whenever he had the chance. If you still insist on gambling, I'll have to work harder so that you won't ever starve to death. He taunted, continuing to walk away, the smirk evident even with his turned-around gaze. Oh, I'm sorry, but that's never happening to me, Adeline proudly declared. Ben Zark observed her, while Wacken directed his gaze towards him. It was highly unusual for the captain to initiate discussions about the past, a departure from his usual reticence when questioned by Wacken and Aster. Wacken looked at his captain with admiration, sensing a different side of him. You are forbidden from treating me as a child. Adeline frowned, asserting her independence. Okay, okay. Ben Zark laughed, acknowledging her protest. Wacken wondered if the captain felt inclined to discuss various matters whenever he was around Adeline. This new facet of the captain was intriguing, and Wacken grinned with joy, elated by the sight. Ben Zark, however, shot a look at Wacken, silently conveying discomfort with those scrutinizing eyes. Let's go to the inn for now. I really worked hard to reserve that room, Wacken declared, taking charge of their plans. Ah, thank you. You've already reserved a room. Adeline expressed her gratitude. Of course. I'm fine with whatever, but I can't let Adeline sleep in a random place. Besides, the captain would have my head if I did this. Wacken chuckled mischievously, stealing a glance at Ben's arc. Ha ha, I see. So where are we heading then? Adeline inquired excitedly, unaware of what was about to unfold. Wacken maintained a grin, leaving Adeline in suspense. They stepped into a grand and opulent inn, greeted by the manager, a man in his early thirties, who hurriedly approached them, brimming with excitement to welcome such esteemed guests. Oh wow, our dear guests! I heard you reserved one royal suite room and one deluxe room, right? he exclaimed with genuine hospitality. Adeline, thrilled by the prospect of staying at the Mayho Inn and in the royal suite, couldn't help but marvel at the opulence surrounding her. However, a sudden realization struck her, 
prompting her to whirl around abruptly. Ah, uh, wait. Did he just say one royal sweet room? She questioned the manager, a hint of disbelief in her tone. Yes, one sweet room and one deluxe room. Our royal suite room has a huge bath inside to allow for a comfortable rest. The manager began explaining in detail, veering into unnecessary boasting. Adeline, uninterested in hearing more about the inn's features, interrupted him, not having expected him to go on a promotional tangent. She wondered if the manager would rectify the situation, perhaps admitting to a mistake in the reservation. The uncertainty hung in the air as Adeline anxiously awaited the manager's response. Wacken, what is this? Adeline turned around and asked Wacken in tension. Have a great time. Please compliment me. Wacken winked at her and showed her a thumbs up. Adeline rolled her eyes, feeling on the verge of tears. He completely misunderstood what she was trying to convey. Air, give me a moment, Ray. Are we going to use the same room? It might be better for why. She turned around and anxiously asked Ben Zark. We're a married couple, aren't we? It'd be strange for us to stay in different rooms. Ben Zark stated matter-of-factly. Adeline, recalling Ben Zark's aversion to sharing a room, considered it even weirder to use separate rooms. Despite their marriage being a mere formality for 25 years, he had never shared a room with anyone else. I mean this. I'm sure you find it troublesome too. She began, flustered, but her words caught in her mouth as Ben Zark calmly responded. Why do you think I would find it troublesome? Do you hate sharing a room with me that much? Adeline blushed intensely, her heart pounding audibly. She reminded herself not to fall for such words. He wasn't asking with any special meaning. Mustering her composure, she thought of the moment when she was killed by her own husband. Determined to focus on maintaining her position, she said, All right. It can't be helped since we've made the reservation already. Let them guide us already. Blushing, she walked ahead without turning around, claiming her legs were starting to hurt. Ben Zark watched her with interest. Okay. After all, I promise to do what you want. Ben Zark smiled, looking at her retreating figure. The manager graciously ushered them into the opulent expanse of the royal suite. Welcome to the royal suite room, he announced with a flourish. Taking the lead, he proceeded to showcase the lavish accommodations to Adeline and Ben Zark. As Adeline absorbed the grandeur of the suite, she realized it wasn't just a room but an entire suite, comprising two separate bedrooms within suite bathrooms and a spacious living area. It dawned on her that she had been fretting needlessly. The separate rooms were exactly what Ben Zark had arranged, a fact that brought a slight flush of embarrassment to her cheeks. I'm truly relieved, she exclaimed, her face breaking into a radiant smile as she turned to Ben Zark, who mirrored her joy. Shall we take a moment to enjoy the view? Ben Zark suggested, inclining his head towards the balcony. Adeline followed his gaze, curiosity piqued. Stepping onto the balcony, her eyes widened in wonder. Oh my! What a breathtaking sight! She exclaimed, her gaze sweeping over the sprawling vista of Mokran City. Her admiration was evident as she took in the panoramic view, her eyes darting from one landmark to another. Meanwhile, Ben Zark stood nearby, leaning against a pillar with his arms folded across his chest, silently observing her with affection. Does it please you? He inquired softly his gaze fixed on her animated expression, her hair gently tousled by the breeze as she soaked in the cityscape. Yes, very much so, Adeline replied, her smile radiant enough to illuminate the dimly lit surroundings, her eyes sparkling in tandem with her grin. I'm glad, Ben Zark murmured, his gaze lingering on her, captivated by her beauty. His heart fluttered in unfamiliar ways, a sensation he couldn't quite place. It was a novel experience, this desire to see someone smile so brightly, but he found himself embracing it without reservation. In the shadowy confines of the restaurant, flickering flames from hanging fire torches and candles casting a soft glow, Adeline and Ben Zark found themselves enveloped in an intimate atmosphere. The majority of the tables sat empty, lending an air of secrecy to the establishment. 
In a secluded corner, a cloaked figure sat, his silhouette illuminated by the firelight, a mug in hand and a sword resting on the table beside him. Adorning his neck was a necklace adorned with intricate designs. Suddenly, the stillness was broken as another cloaked figure entered the restaurant, making his way purposefully toward the seated man. Captain! The newcomer addressed him, pulling back his hood to reveal a youthful face framed by brown hair. His excitement was palpable as he spoke, the fire casting shadows across his features. What is it, Koken? The seated man inquired, his voice steady as he kept his gaze fixed elsewhere, his cup placed delicately on the table. I discovered some interesting individuals during lunchtime, a woman dressed as a man, a noble, and a guard. Koken divulged eagerly, leaning in to share his findings with the captain. And how is that supposed to be interesting? The man with yellow eyes interjected, his tone tinged with skepticism. They booked the royal suite room at Mayhoen. You know that not just anybody can book that room during the gladiator contest, right? Koken exclaimed, his excitement palpable as he relayed the details to his superior. He was confident that his captain would find this information invaluable. He's that rich? The man mused, tapping his fingers on the table in surprise. I hate tiresome stuff, so just bring the girl to me when the guys aren't there. After that, I'll let you have a taste of some money. Get ready immediately. The man ordered, rising from his seat and retrieving his sword before issuing further instructions. With that, he departed, leaving Koken to prepare for the task at hand. The following day dawned bright and sunny, prompting Adeline to embark on a shopping expedition with Ben Zark and Wacken in tow. While Adeline was filled with boundless energy, her companions found themselves weary from the day's activities. Next is this way, Adeline exclaimed, beckoning them excitedly towards a nearby shop. As Ben Zark and Wacken caught up to her, they found Adeline engrossed in conversation with the shop attendant, who was displaying various clothing options. Is this type of lace popular in this district? Oh my gosh, madam, this ornament is so adorable! Adeline exclaimed, her enthusiasm evident in her rising voice as she examined the items with keen interest. Young lady, you're more adorable! The shop lady complimented Adeline, earning a bright smile from her. Adeline would have sulked for the rest of her life if she hadn't been able to come here, Captain. She seems so excited. Wacken remarked, grinning from ear to ear as he relayed his observation to Ben Zark, who nodded in agreement. Adeline, how long will you stay here? I have to contact them in advance in order to prepare a carriage in the capital. Wacken inquired, addressing Adeline before informing her of his impending departure. Ah, uh, four days is more than enough. Adeline replied promptly, her mind already calculating the time frame. For her, the journey to Mavane Island held greater significance, and she was confident that the Eagle Mercenary Corps would make contact by tomorrow, given the ostentatious display of wealth they had witnessed. With a green dress in hand, she focused on her priorities. I'll go visit the wire service, so the two of you should continue your shopping together, Wacken announced, waving at Adeline before taking his leave. Thank you, Wacken. Adeline expressed her gratitude with a warm smile. No problem. Wacken responded with a nod before departing, leaving Ben Zark and Adeline alone once more. Now then, shall we continue shopping? Ben Zark asked, though his tone betrayed his boredom. Adeline's attention was drawn to the shopping bags in Ben Zark's hand, realizing for the first time that he had been silently carrying them all along without complaint. Sorry. I should have given some to Wacken before we sent him off. Give some to me. It's heavy, right? Adeline apologized, leaning towards Ben Zark to retrieve the bags, but he gently moved away, his eyes filled with tenderness. Despite her offer, he showed no signs of embarrassment about carrying her belongings. It's fine. It seems like you still have some places to visit. Let's keep going, Ben Zark replied, turning away and resuming their walk Adeline's cheeks flushed with embarrassment at the thought of him holding her things. No, but how can I continue shopping with all of this? Um, Ray, since I want to rest a bit, will you go to the room and drop the bags off? 
We can have tea together when you come back. I'll be looking around a few more stores here, she suggested, her smile radiant enough to melt something within Ben's arc. Despite the sudden rush of warmth to his face, he quickly composed himself. Will you be okay alone? He asked, his concern evident in his tone. Yes, please hurry back when you're done. Ladies want to shop a bit on their own sometimes. Adeline replied, emphasizing her words to convey sentiments she couldn't express outright. I'll be back shortly. Ben Zark assured her before heading off to the hotel. Yes, I'll be waiting. Adeline called out, waving goodbye. With Ben Zark gone, she seized the opportunity to attend to a matter she wished to address in private, her mind consumed with thoughts of its success. As Ben Zark traversed the streets back to the hotel, a nagging sensation alerted him to the presence of someone following him. Deliberately, he veered into an alley, intending to confront his pursuer. True to his instincts, the shadowy figure followed suit, trailing him with intent. A back alley? Damn it, where is he wandering off to? It'll be troublesome if I lose him. I should follow H- -dash. The man trailing Ben Zark muttered to himself, his words halted as Ben Zark suddenly emerged from the shadows, swiftly seizing him and pinning him against the wall with an arm around his neck. Who the hell are you? Why were you shadowing me? Ben Zark demanded, his gaze icy and his sword gleaming ominously against the man's neck. Depending on how you answer, Ben Zark continued, his teeth clenched in frustration. I might just decide to kill you rather than let you live. The man attempted to speak, but his words were stammered and disjointed. Judging by his demeanor, he didn't seem like a killer. Perhaps he had been contemplating robbery instead. It would be best if I never see your face again, Ben Zark declared, releasing the man, who collapsed to the ground in a heap. As he fell, something glinted and fell from his pockets, a silver necklace. Ben Zark bent down to retrieve it, examining the pendant closely. Etched upon it was the emblem of the Eagle Mercenary Corps, along with some inscribed characters. This was the Eagle Mercenary Corps? Ben Zark mused, recognizing the familiar insignia. He pondered why mercenaries affiliated with the Corps had been tailing him, their motives shrouded in mystery. In the softly illuminated room, Adeline's gaze sparkled with anticipation as she beheld the source of the gentle blue light emanating from the pink bag. I did it! She exclaimed with palpable excitement. Attempting to harness the power of infinity magic, a form of spatial manipulation renowned for its complexity, Adeline embarked on a daring feat though whispers of its difficulty echoed through her mind. She couldn't shake the doubt lingering from past encounters with Ray, uncertain if her magical prowess truly exceeded the ordinary. Yet, amidst these musings, a sense of satisfaction enveloped her, casting a gentle glow over her thoughts as she gazed out the window. Pondering the whereabouts of Ray, Adeline's mind flitted to the arrangements made with the shopkeeper to direct him to their rendezvous at the tea house upon his return. Doubt crept in as the minutes ticked by, prompting her to skin the surroundings from her perch on the chair. A sudden knock disrupted her reverie, drawing her attention back to the present moment. As the echo of the knocks reverberated through the room, a voice from beyond the door signaled the arrival of an unexpected visitor. Ma'am, your ordered drink is ready. The waiter's voice drifted in, catching Adeline off guard. Drink? She echoed, perplexed by the unexpected delivery. Confusion clouded her thoughts as she processed the revelation. She hadn't placed an order, having intended to wait for Ray's return to make their selections together. The discrepancy between expectation and reality left her gazing at the door with a mixture of curiosity and apprehension. Amidst her attempt to protest and clarify her lack of order, a sudden intrusion shattered Adeline's words as an unknown figure burst into the room with alarming speed. Before she could even catch a glimpse of the intruder, a sharp, pungent scent assaulted her senses as a chloroform-soaked cloth covered her nose and mouth. Her eyes widened in terror as she struggled to make out the identity of her assailant. Koken, she managed to murmur, disbelief mingling with fear. Why now, of all moments, when Ray was nowhere to be found? The realization of her vulnerability in this unexpected encounter left her feeling utterly helpless. 
This wasn't how she had envisioned their reunion. Despite her best efforts to resist, Adeline found herself overpowered by the relentless force exerted upon her. The man who stood before her was none other than Koken, vice leader of the Eagle Mercenary Corps, a familiar face from her past. In a flood of memories, she recalled his unwavering support during times of strife, a beacon of loyalty amidst uncertainty. I cannot comprehend why Lady Adeline endures such treatment. The Duchess is not the woman of concern. It is Lady Adeline whom I stand by. Koken voiced his confusion, echoing sentiments of allegiance that once defined their bond. Adeline found solace in these memories, a reminder of the allies she had once relied upon. With one final, futile attempt to resist, Adeline grasped at Koken's arm, her resolve faltering in the face of overwhelming force. In this moment of vulnerability, she realized the importance of locating those who had stood by her side, for only together could they hope to withstand the trials ahead. In the midst of fading consciousness, Adeline's thoughts drifted to a question posed by Wacken. Is protecting people Adeline's hobby? She acknowledged it as more than a hobby. It was a calling she couldn't ignore. As her resistance waned and darkness encroached upon her mind, a pang of realization struck her. They were all stronger than her. How could she have forgotten? In her past life, the devastating aftermath of the heavenly demonic war loomed large in her memories. The names of her fallen comrades, Wacken, A.S., Maven, Koken, and Avid, echoed in her mind as she recalled the fateful moment when their lives were snuffed out, leaving her alone beside Ray. Meanwhile, Ben Zark arrived at the hotel with shopping bags in tow, only to encounter Wacken outside, indulging in a makeshift meal. Surprised by his captain's unexpected presence, Wacken's attempt to hide his astonishment fell short as he inquired about Adeline's whereabouts. Ben Zark, with a tinge of embarrassment, explained that Adeline had instructed him to deposit some of the bags at the Indu to their abundance. Wacken's reaction was palpable, his amusement evident as a cough betrayed his attempt to mask his laughter. He couldn't help but marvel at the sight of his usually composed captain, now displaying a rare vulnerability. Internally seething at the inconvenience of encountering Wacken, Ben Zark braced himself for the inevitable teasing to come. Meanwhile, Wacken mused on the shifting dynamics within their group, noting how Ben Zark seemed to acquiesce to Adeline's every whim, unwittingly swayed by her influence. He couldn't help but admire Adeline's remarkable ability to command respect and loyalty. Lost in contemplation, Wacken envisioned humorous scenarios of Ben Zark dutifully following Adeline's directives like a loyal puppy, a testament to her charismatic leadership. Shaking himself from his reverie, Wacken refocused on the present, his concern for Adeline overriding his playful musings. Anyway, where is Adeline? Wacken inquired, scanning the surroundings with furrowed brows, his worry palpable. As the realization dawned upon him, Wacken's mind raced with concern. Was Adeline nearby, waiting for them? His last fleeting thoughts centered around her proximity. Adele said she wanted to keep shopping. Ben Zark began, but his words were cut short by Wacken's abrupt interjection. What? Wacken exclaimed incredulously, his voice rising in alarm. Are you telling me that Adeline is currently alone? His words rang out loudly a mix of disbelief and frustration. Wacken couldn't fathom how Ben Zark could be so careless. The gravity of the situation hit Ben Zark like a sudden blow, leaving him stunned and speechless. He recoiled in shock, realizing the magnitude of his oversight. Captain, this is Mokrin City. It's the kind of place where anything can happen. Even strong male nobles have escorts with them, so why did you leave Adeline alone? Wacken's admonishments echoed in Benzark's ears as he fought to process the gravity of his mistake. Before Wacken could finish his sentence, Benzark was already sprinting through the streets, propelled by a mixture of panic and regret. Darn it, I forgot. Benzark muttered under his breath, his frustration palpable with every stride. As he raced against time, memories of Adeline's joyful anticipation of their future tea gathering flooded his mind her radiant smile etched vividly in his memory. I was too blinded by her smile. What a fool I'd been! 
Ben Zark chastised himself as he ran, the weight of his carelessness bearing down heavily upon him. The fear of losing Adeline gnawed at his insides, a haunting specter that threatened to consume him entirely. The mere thought of her falling into harm's way was unbearable, a scenario he couldn't bear to contemplate. Arriving at the designated tea spot, Wacken and Ben Zark wasted no time in seeking information from the manager. However, their inquiries were met with rudeness and dismissiveness. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but we've never had a customer like that. The manager retorted brusquely, his eyes rolling in annoyance. Undeterred, Wacken persisted, providing a vivid description of Adeline's features in hopes of jogging the manager's memory. Ben Zark, too, nodded in agreement, reinforcing the details. Sir, please try to recall. How many people do you think disappear around here? How am I supposed to remember and find all of them? The manager retorted dismissively, his attempts to maintain composure faltering as frustration seeped through. Before he could stop himself, the manager's words unwittingly revealed crucial information. Wacken's description hadn't included any mention of a woman wearing men's clothing, yet the manager's slip of the tongue betrayed his knowledge of such a detail, describing Adeline's appearance with alarming accuracy. Swift as a hawk, Ben Zark seized the manager by the collar, his grip tight with fury. You! How did you know about a lady wearing men's clothes? Ben Zark's voice sliced through the air like ice, each word dripping with cold intensity as he bore into the manager with an unyielding gaze. Caught in the vice-like grip of Ben Zark's fury, the manager's facade crumbled, tears mingling with fear as he stammered incoherently, his secrets laid bare by the weight of Ben Zark's interrogation. Ben Zark forcefully cornered the manager, gripping his neck tightly, his eyes ablaze with fury. If you don't want to lose your head right here, he warned icily, his demeanor suggesting he wouldn't hesitate to follow through on the threat. Struggling to break free, the manager's futile attempts were met with tears of desperation. Witnessing the scene unfold, Wacken intervened, his expression reflecting concern as he addressed Ben Zark. It was evident from the manager's trembling form that fear had taken hold. Captain, stop it! He's going to die. We won't be able to find Adeline if you kill him. Wacken's urgent plea resonated with Ben Zark, prompting him to release his grip on the manager. Cursing under his breath in frustration, Ben Zark relented, allowing the manager to catch his breath amidst coughs and gasps. Seated beside the shaken manager, Wacken offered a moment of respite, his tone softening as he addressed him. You admitted it yourself, didn't you? Wacken's smirk hinted at a revelation, prompting the manager to recall his earlier words. There are many people who disappear around here. The manager recollected, his tear-filled eyes meeting Wacken's gaze, a palpable sense of dread hanging in the air. Wacken's stern inquiry seemed to break the silence. With his arms crossed over his chest, Ben Zark stood stoically, his attention focused elsewhere. Do you feel like talking now? Wacken's firm tone prompted a response from the manager, who began to speak tentatively. Ben Zark's gaze shifted to him, silently urging him to continue. The Black Wind the manager's words hung in the air, eliciting a surprised reaction from Ben's arc. As Adeline regained consciousness, the sounds of muffled voices filled her ears, disorienting her senses. Gradually adjusting to the light, she discerned the faint outlines of figures conversing nearby. I told you to treat her carefully. One voice sounded agitated. No, I said she collapsed on her own. Another voice retorted defensively. Struggling to focus, Adeline felt someone leaning over her, their concerned voice breaking through the haze of her confusion. Hey, have you come to your senses? It was Koken, his presence providing a semblance of familiarity amidst the disarray. Where is this? My head hurts too much. Ugh. Adeline's attempt to survey her surroundings was interrupted by a sudden onslaught of flashbacks. Images of bloodstains, stones, patterns, chains, and the ominous figure of the demon king flashed before her mind's eye. What were those memories just now? What exactly happened for everyone to die like that? Deva's power had definitely grown stronger. They weren't so weak that they would die in an instant. No way. Did the demon king awaken? 
It was okay. Deva's downfall is a story of the distant future. As long as her memories return little by little from now on, she should be able to change it. Lady, answer my question if you've woken up. Don't try to use your brain. Koken's commanding voice jolted her back to the present, and she looked up to see him standing before her. Deciding to take charge of the situation, she spoke with a calm resolve. You saved me the trouble of finding you since I wanted to meet you anyway. Nice to meet you, Avid, she greeted, a faint smile gracing her lips. Unbound and seated in a chair, she observed the surprise etched on their faces, particularly Avid's, who appeared taken aback by her use of his name and her familiarity with him. I don't remember your face. How do you know my previous name? Avid's features bore two scars, one near his eyes and the other near his lips. His burgundy hair and yellow eyes added to his distinctive appearance. Reacting swiftly to her mention of his name, he reached for his sword, pressing it against her throat. Undeterred, she met his gaze with a steely resolve. You will regret it if you kill me, she warned, her tone carrying a cold edge. What an interesting lady. Lady, how many times do you think I've heard that line while dealing with the nobles? A smirk played across Avid's lips as he began to relish the encounter. Am I supposed to know something like that? Since your objective must be money anyway, I'm just saying that we should save our time. She retorted, rolling her eyes in exasperation. No longer blocking the sword, she displayed a nonchalant demeanor, refusing to show fear or beg for her life like others in similar situations. Avid, sensing her composure, withdrew his sword and took a few steps back intrigued by the unfolding exchange. Why are you so certain that we're doing this for money? Avid's curiosity piqued as he questioned her. It's simple when you think about it. We stayed in the best and that is difficult for even high nobles to reserve, and the woman was walking around Mokran City without even an escort. You must have used that opportunity to kidnap me. Adeline reasoned, her demeanor betraying a sense of nonchalance. Avid smirked, intrigued by her astute observation. So what's your point? He inquired, his interest evident. I'm telling you to be careful of who you are dealing with. Some people might not have escorts because they don't think about it, but... Adeline's tone shifted, carrying a subtle warning as she continued. But there's a possibility that they are strong enough to not require an escort. Her cold eyes conveyed the seriousness of her message. Suddenly, commotion erupted from outside, startling them all. Avid's gaze hardened as he turned towards the door, questioning the disturbance. What is this commotion? He exclaimed, his frustration evident. The sounds of smacking, shouting, and thudding against the door filled the room, signaling trouble. Interrupting the tense atmosphere, one of their men burst into the room, his panic state palpable. Leader! There's a monstrous guy outside. Arg. He managed to convey between gasps, clearly shaken by what he had witnessed. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Adeline watched as Ben Zark and Wacken entered the room together, their presence commanding attention. Despite Ben Zark's simmering anger, he maintained a facade of calm, while Wacken's hand rested on his sword, ready for action. Avid reacted swiftly, raising his arms and whispering audibly ensuring Adeline could hear his instructions amidst the chaos. Oh boy, I was wondering why you were so calm. I guess you were counting on them, Avid remarked, observing the sudden arrival of Ben Zark and Wacken with a mix of surprise and suspicion. Adeline, unsure of the circumstances that led to their presence, found herself bewildered by the unexpected turn of events. As Ben Zark and Wacken rushed towards her, concern etched on their faces. Adeline remained in a state of confusion, trying to piece together the unfolding situation. She hadn't anticipated their intervention, especially since she had planned to reveal her identity as the wife of the Duke of Darkness and negotiate terms with Avid. Ben Zark reached her first, his worried expression mirroring her own confusion. You too, how did you find this place? Adeline questioned, her surprise evident. Adeline! You can't even begin to imagine it. You see, the captain. Wacken began, 
intending to explain the sequence of events that led them to her location after receiving the manager's revelation about the Black Wind. Black Wind. It's the Eagle Mercenary Corps that Adeline wanted to hire. We can't exactly find and eliminate them all. What, Captain? Wacken's explanation was interrupted as Benzark's demeanor shifted abruptly. Seating himself on the ground, Benzark placed his hand on the ground, a faint blue light emanating from his touch as magic began to manifest. Startled by Benzark's sudden actions, Wacken watched in shock, realizing the gravity of what his companion was attempting. Despite his hopes that Benzark's actions weren't as dire as they seemed, he couldn't shake the sinking feeling that his suspicions were warranted. I'm going to use search magic, Ben Zark declared firmly, his tone resolute as he made a decision that he knew carried significant risks. Despite the potential dangers, his primary concern remained Adeline's safety. Captain? Wait a moment. Captain, are you serious? You can't use that magic. Azura might find your location if you use this. It will be dangerous if that happens. Wacken's urgent protest fell on deaf ears as Ben Zark proceeded with the spell, his determination overriding any objections. That doesn't matter. Ben Zark responded abruptly to Wacken's warnings, his focus unwavering as he rose to his feet. With unwavering resolve, he was prepared to go to any lengths to locate Adeline, and the spell quickly revealed her whereabouts. That's what happened. Wacken concluded exhaling deeply as he recounted the sequence of events to Adeline. Oh my! Adeline's stunned expression conveyed her disbelief at the turn of events. She struggled to come to terms with the reality of Benzark's extraordinary actions. Let's go! Benzark urged softly, his gaze avoiding hers as he motioned for her to leave the premises, intent on removing her from harm's way. Adeline's mind raced with conflicting thoughts as she contemplated Benzark's unexpected heroism. Despite her disbelief, she couldn't deny the surge of gratitude and admiration swelling within her. I remembered what we talked about before, so I didn't kill them. Benzark's explanation barely registered as Adeline's focus shifted inward, her attention consumed by the tumultuous rhythm of her own heartbeat. Meanwhile, Avid stepped forward shedding his cloak of indifference to reveal a genuine curiosity. I can't believe this is happening. Hey, can you explain the situation to me? He inquired, his smile tinged with intrigue as he turned to Ben Zark for clarification. Ben Zark and Adeline were engrossed in conversation when they were interrupted by Avid's voice. Hey, can you explain the situation to me? Both turned towards Avid simultaneously. Adeline, in the midst of tying her hair, quickly finished and redirected her attention to him, momentarily forgetting their initial purpose due to the interruption. Clearing her throat, she introduced herself. Ahem, please excuse me. I didn't expect this situation either. It's a bit late, but let me introduce myself. I'm the wife of this Duke of Darkness, Adeline Lawton. She gestured towards Ben Zark. Avid, visibly shocked, stuttered. What? D Duke of Darkness? His disbelief was palpable, beads of sweat forming on his forehead. Eventually, they found themselves seated across from each other, Adeline and Avid facing one another with Ben Zark and Wacken standing behind Adeline. A cup of tea sat on the table between them. Well then, let's start the negotiation, Adeline declared in a clear, assertive tone. Avid chuckled inwardly, recognizing that this wasn't a negotiation at all. It was a veiled threat delivered with a disarming smile. Irritated by the charade, Avid met the unwavering gaze of Ben Zark, sensing an underlying seriousness that compelled him to play along. So, what kind of negotiation are you looking for? Avid sighed, reaching for his cup of tea as he awaited Adeline's response, silently acknowledging the shift from confrontation to diplomacy. Please become a loyal knight for my husband, Adeline calmly requested, clasping her hands together. Wacken shot Ben Zark a playful glance, still reveling in the joy of being referred to as her husband. Are you kidding me? Avid blurted out in frustration, his annoyance evident in his loud outburst. You! His tirade was cut short as his gaze once again locked with Ben Zark's, 
feeling a sense of unease wash over him as he sensed an implicit threat. Do you have any complaints about what my wife just said? Benzark's voice cut through the tension, his cold stare sending a shiver down Avid's spine. As Avid glanced around, everything appeared normal, except for Adeline patiently awaiting his response. Never mind, you mean er, ma'am? Avid cleared his throat, setting down his cup with deliberate care, his demeanor shifting to a more respectful tone. Please call me Adeline. She responded with a radiant smile, her hand delicately placed under her chin. Okay. Adeline, do you know what a mercenary is? Avid inquired, adopting a serious, professional tone. Do you think I would have made that suggestion without even knowing that? Adeline's expression turned intrigued as she locked eyes with Avid. Quietly contemplating her response, Avid turned to Ben Zark, seeking further guidance. No, I mean... Horace Ben Zark, even the Emperor can't go against you, right? Yet, are you planning to use mere mercenaries like us as knights? Even when we are the infamous Black Wind? Avid directly engaged Ben Zark emphasizing his name and posing a question regarding their intended role. He then gestured towards his troop, seeking clarification if Adeline still intended to recruit them given their notorious reputation. Adeline calmly took a sip of her tea, observing the exchange. I'm well aware of your infamy. You do anything that earns you money, and I heard you received the name of Black Wind because only despair remains after you pass, right? Adeline remarked, placing her cup down before interlocking her hands under her chin, a mischievous grin playing on her lips. Am I right, Avid Kanta? Her tone subtly shifted, catching Avid off guard. Not only did she acknowledge his old family name, but she also hinted at knowing more than she let on. Avid frowned, displeased by her knowledge. Who the hell are you? How do you know my family name? Avid's glare intensified his voice matching Adeline's cold demeanor. It doesn't matter how I know it. What's important is that I know, right? Adeline nonchalantly set her cup aside, maintaining her enigmatic demeanor. Well, I guess that's true. Avid's gaze darted around nervously, beads of sweat forming on his brow. He couldn't shake the feeling of unease. Why did Adeline choose their troop out of everyone, especially when they had ample resources? The Duke of Darkness shouldn't be indiscriminately recruiting anyone as their knights. As realization dawned on him, Avid paused, understanding the underlying motive behind their unconventional choice of mercenaries. Ah, uh, so that's why, Avid whispered audibly, and Adeline's smile widened, acknowledging that Avid had pieced together part of the puzzle. I guess you managed to figure out this much, she remarked in a composed tone. Skilled knights wouldn't set foot in the land of darkness, so it's easier to take mercenaries like us who'll do anything for money, right? Avid verbalized his thoughts aloud, almost seeking confirmation. Adeline rose from her seat, placing both hands on the table. Yes, that's one of the reasons, but it's also because I am sure you will make excellent knights, she explained calmly, approaching Avid with deliberate steps. Intrigued, Avid tilted his head to meet her gaze. How can you be sure about that? He inquired with a curious smile. Because I'm a prophet. I'm sorry, but I can't tell you anything else because it's a business secret. Adeline grinned mischievously, her eyes twinkling with amusement. Ha, huh, Erm, Duke, does your wife usually brute force things like this? Avid redirected his question towards Ben Zark, unable to maintain eye contact with Adeline. That's our ma'am's charm. Isn't that right, Captain? Wacken interjected with a smirk, glancing at Ben Zark. A faint blush colored Ben Zark's cheeks as he admitted to occasionally wanting to delve into Adeline's thoughts, intrigued by her unpredictable nature. He studied Adeline quietly, attempting to discern her motives. Avid finally released a heavy sigh, rolling his eyes in exasperation. Okay, let's suppose that our mercenary corps becomes your knights. What can you do for us? Avid asked in a somewhat annoyed tone, his hand resting on his forehead. We can provide a comfortable home, money, and lessons. Adeline replied eloquently, outlining their potential benefits. Is that it? We can get that much by ourselves. 
That isn't profitable at all. What kind of negotiation? Abbott's bored voice trailed off as he expressed his lack of interest in Adeline's initial offer. However, his nonchalance turned to shock as he noticed Wacken and Benzark reaching for their swords. Then what do you want in return for becoming our knights? Adeline attempted to salvage the negotiation by offering to fulfill their desires. Hmm, for example, the world. We would need at least the Roman continent for it to be worth it for us. Avid proposed in a teasing manner, fully aware that such a demand was impossible to fulfill, setting them up for failure. The world, huh, that's interesting. I never thought your dream would be world domination. Adeline tapped the table thoughtfully, amusement dancing in her eyes. That would be the minimum you would need to make our eagle mercenary corps into your knights, Avid asserted dominantly. I think I misunderstood you. I didn't think your world would be a mere continent. Adeline casually shrugged, challenging Avid's audacious demand. Hey, a mere continent? Do you realize what you just say, Dash? Avid's protest was cut short as Adeline murmured. Elise. Avid's eyes widened in disbelief. I thought Elise was your world. Adeline innocently placed her hand on her cheek, stunning Avid with her knowledge. You, how do you dash? Avid's anger boiled over as he stood up abruptly, his voice trembling with rage. Lower your voice. Benzark's stern command silenced Avid, his arms folded across his stomach. Elise. Avid sank back into his seat, muttering the name with a mix of confusion and longing. Leader. Wacken looked at Avid with concern, sensing the weight of his emotions. Elise. Avid repeated the name slowly, memories flooding back to him. He envisioned Elise, her image clear in his mind, a girl in a green dress with a long French knot, standing in a sunflower field, her presence evoking a sense of serenity. Are you telling me that you can find her? Avid's voice softened, filled with hope and anticipation, his demeanor transformed by the possibility of reuniting with Elise. Avid had regained his composure returning to his seat with clenched fists placed firmly on the table. Are you telling me that you can find Elise? He asked in a hushed tone, his disbelief evident. That's right, Adeline confirmed, standing nearby with her hands bound behind her back. She observed the myriad of unspoken words reflected in Avid's eyes, understanding the depth of his emotions. I don't know where you've heard about that, but I will not become some night dog for something like that. Avid retorted coldly, crossing his arms over his chest. You will definitely come to regret it if you send me away like this. Adeline responded, her tone persuasive, offering Avid a chance to reconsider the situation. That's... Avid faltered, unable to articulate his thoughts. Adeline sensed his hesitation, noting the tension in his clenched jaw. I know what you are worrying about. You can get used and thrown away just because you're a mercenary corps. I understand that's why you can't accept requests so easily. Adeline spoke slowly, her voice tinged with empathy born from personal experience. Avid recognized the sincerity in her words. Th, that's why I hate nobles. I'm sick and tired of them and being used and thrown away. Avid's voice rose with anger, his frustration palpable. Adeline lowered her head her gaze cast downward, concealing her eyes from view as she absorbed Avid's outburst. She was lost deep in her own thoughts, consumed by a familiar feeling. Avid sensed her sadness, his concern evident as he confronted Adeline. A noble like you knows how I feel? There's no way that's Dash. Avid's voice rose to a shout, his anger palpable as he struggled to comprehend Adeline's empathy. You're right. If only my entire life wasn't filled with that feeling. Adeline's voice trailed off sadly as she clasped her hands together in a gesture of melancholy. Avid was taken aback by her admission, his shock evident as he processed her words. However, Adeline's demeanor swiftly shifted, her expression brightening as she regained her energy. Anyway, if you can't believe me, then how about this, half a year? Let's decide on your tenure being for half a year. Adeline proposed a new arrangement, pacing around the table to emphasize her points. Half a year? 
Avid's surprise was evident as he processed the suggestion. I hope that you folks will become useful knights, and you want a lease. Therefore, in half a year from now, why don't we prove our worth to each other? Adeline's smile exuded confidence as she outlined the terms of the proposal. Her words held sway over Avid, who sat deep in thought, contemplating the offer. So what you mean is, if in half a year Elise isn't by my side, I get to quit being a knight. Avid sought clarification, ensuring he understood the terms correctly. That's right, and if you all aren't able to increase your skills, then you will not get to see Elise at all. Adeline affirmed, nodding in assurance that the deal was indeed advantageous. Avid was plunged into a sea of contemplation, torn between accepting the deal and considering the implications for his subordinates. Just as Avid grappled with this decision, Koken approached him, leaning in to engage in conversation, interrupting his train of thought. Captain, accept. Koken urged Avid to embrace the offer, his tone firm and resolute. What? Avid's surprise was evident as he turned to face Koken. This is Elise, who you've been searching all over for. If it weren't for you, Captain, none of us would even be here. Therefore, you should accept. Your wish is our wish, Koken declared, placing his hands on his waist, exuding unwavering support and conviction. Another member of the group chimed in to reinforce Koken's sentiment. Ah, uh, finally, we will be able to end this crappy mercenary life, a cheerful young man with brown hair exclaimed, his grin infectious as he expressed his excitement. A younger, red-haired boy eagerly joined the conversation, curious about the adventures that awaited them as knights. Oh? So if we become knights, will we be doing cool stuff? He asked with anticipation. The knight's pledge? Hey, do you think it even fits your image? Their banter filled the air as Avid's subordinates exchanged light-hearted remarks, their laughter echoing in the room. Avid watched them silently, a sense of pride swelling within him as he observed their camaraderie. Turning towards Adeline, he couldn't help but smile genuinely. Did you just hear them? My subordinates are quite magnificent, aren't they? Avid's affection for his team was evident in his tone as he addressed Adeline. You're right. They really are magnificent. Adeline agreed, returning his smile. Following their exchange, negotiations with Avid proceeded swiftly. Avid's party was to settle their personal affairs within the next month, and to ensure their safe passage through the forest. Ben Zark and Adeline agreed to send assistance at the appropriate time. Avid sealed the deal with a handshake. Also, the clipper? How do you know about that? Avid's curiosity was piqued as he recalled Adeline mentioning the clipper. I have some business at Mavane Island. We're trying to get there covertly. Adeline explained, shedding light on her knowledge of the clipper. Avid sighed in resignation. My gosh! Do we even have the power to deny you? Do as you please, Avid conceded, rolling his eyes and gesturing for Adeline to proceed as she wished. Adeline chuckled in response, the tension of negotiations finally dissipating. Later that day, Ben Zark and Adeline decided to dine out, taking a seat across from each other at a restaurant. Adeline couldn't shake off her nervousness, feeling as though everything was progressing at an awkwardly steady pace. The atmosphere between them felt heavy, and even the sumptuous spread of food on the table couldn't alleviate the tension. While Benzark focused on his meal with concentration, Adeline struggled to eat properly, nervously cutting her steak. Um, what about Wacken? Adeline attempted to break the silence, hoping to ease the discomfort in the air. He said he'd already eaten to the point where he felt that he was about to explode. Benzark replied subtly but the room remained engulfed in awkward silence. The tension between them grew palpable, each feeling the weight of the other's presence. I see, Adeline responded shortly, her gaze returning to the table laden with food. Despite the abundance of dishes, the atmosphere remained decidedly uncomfortable. Adeline couldn't help but feel the stark contrast between their current meal and their previous ones at the mansion. Ben Zark glanced at Adeline, recalling the earlier exchange. He couldn't shake the feeling of loneliness he had sensed in her, a sensation all too familiar to him. As Adeline lifted a piece of meat with her fork, 
she noticed Benzark's intense gaze fixed upon her. Do you have something that you want to tell me? She inquired, meeting his gaze. He shook his head, diverting his attention back to his plate. No, it's not anything special. Here, take this. Benzark handed her a pink bag, prompting a surprised murmur from Adeline as she eagerly retrieved it. I thought I'd lost it, she exclaimed with excitement, her eyes gleaming with joy. Koken was holding on to it. He must have thought it was worth a lot when he kidnapped you, Benzark remarked casually. Ha ha, Adeline laughed, imagining Koken's antics. Also, I felt magic on it, Benzark added, his gaze locking with hers. Yes, you're right. I discovered it in a shop. Curiously enough, I can put in this and that, and everything fits. Adeline eagerly shared the details with him. Ah, uh, is that so? Ben Zark nodded, his attention returning to the food before him. He isn't asking about it very much. Thank goodness, Adeline thought to herself, taking a sip of wine. However, she caught Ben Zark staring at her intently, causing her to blush under his gaze. Why are you staring at me so intently? If someone else saw, they would think you're looking because I'm so pretty. She nervously joked, attempting to lighten the mood. His response, however, caught her off guard. That's correct, he replied calmly, his words causing her to choke on her drink in disbelief. W, what did you say? Adeline stared at him in astonishment, unable to believe her ears. I'm looking at you because you're pretty, Ben Zark reiterated calmly, his eyes locked with hers. The way that your face blushes reminds me of peaches, he continued his own cheeks flushing with embarrassment. W what? Adeline's nervousness only intensified, her disbelief evident as she stared back at him. Was this person actually insane? She thought in disbelief, feeling flustered and unsure of how to respond. Do you dislike being called pretty? Benzark's question was posed in a firm tone, his gaze piercing as he locked eyes with Adeline, seemingly attempting to decipher her thoughts. What? And no. It's, it's just too sudden. Adeline's initial surprise quickly gave way to nervousness, her demeanor shifting abruptly. She set down her knife and fork, her appetite suddenly vanishing as a flush crept across her cheeks. She found it difficult to maintain eye contact, her discomfort palpable. Although Adeline couldn't deny that being called pretty didn't feel unpleasant, she couldn't shake the weight of her past experiences. Memories of her former self, plagued by insecurities and self-doubt, resurfaced. She remembered how any hint of affection would dredge up painful memories, leaving her torn between happiness and discomfort. The fear of being hurt again loomed large in her mind. Did she truly believe that Ben Zark loved her? Unlike in the past, when his actions spoke volumes of his devotion, Adeline found herself grappling with conflicting emotions. Happy yet uneasy, she couldn't shake the memories of countless nights spent in tears. Despite her efforts to move beyond her past, Adeline couldn't escape the shadow it cast over her present. She wrestled with the fear of repeating past mistakes, unsure if she was ready to confront the vulnerabilities that lay dormant within her. And nothing. By the way, you are really keeping your promise as a husband. You even called me pretty. We look like a real couple. Adeline chuckled nervously, attempting to steer the conversation away from the tension that hung between them. Her laughter was forced, a feeble attempt to diffuse the awkwardness that enveloped them. With her eyes closed and a forced smile plastered on her face, Adeline's attempt at levity only served to exacerbate Benzark's unease. You are my wife, Benzark asserted firmly, his tone leaving no room for ambiguity. It was as if he was reminding her of their roles in this charade they had agreed upon. I'm pretending to be one for the benefit of both of us, Adeline replied, her gaze averted as she struggled to meet his eyes. Despite her efforts to deflect his probing, her flushed cheeks betrayed her discomfort. Do you not? Ben Zark began, poised to voice his concerns, but before he could finish, Adeline abruptly rose from her seat, pushing her chair back in haste. It was as if she couldn't bear the weight of his gaze or the impending conversation. 
I'm sorry, I have no appetite right now. Can I return first? Adeline's request was hurried, her voice strained as she sought an escape from the stifling atmosphere. Without waiting for a response, she turned to leave the room, only to feel Benzark's hand wrap around her wrist, halting her in her tracks. Their eyes locked, an unspoken plea passing between them as time seemed to stand still. In Benzark's gaze, Adeline saw a vulnerability she hadn't expected, a desperation that tugged at her heartstrings. It's you who called me, your husband. I liked hearing that from you. Benzark's voice wavered slightly, belying the intensity of his emotions. His admission hung heavy in the air, laden with unspoken truths and unexplored depths. For a moment, Adeline hesitated, torn between her own fears and the raw vulnerability she saw reflected in Benzark's eyes. But then, with a decisive shake of her hand, she freed herself from his grasp and turned away, the weight of their unspoken words lingering in the air as she made her exit, leaving Ben's arc to grapple with his own uncertainties. Have a nice meal. Adeline's words hung in the air as she walked away, her voice tinged with a hint of sorrow. She didn't dare to look back, her heart heavy with unresolved emotions. The bustling restaurant buzzed with the laughter and chatter of patrons. But Ben Zark remained motionless, his gaze fixed on the empty chair where Adeline had been seated just moments before. He longed to see her smile once more, to bask in the warmth of her presence. He sighed heavily, the weight of his emotions pressing down on him. It seemed absurd to him now, how he had once sought to win her favor, how he had been captivated by the unfamiliar sensation of his heart skipping a beat at the sight of her. As memories flooded his mind, he couldn't help but recall the tender moments they had shared, moments that now seemed so distant. He remembered the way her smile had lit up her face, filling him with a sense of longing and contentment. Yet, even as he reminisced, he couldn't shake the feeling of emptiness that now gnawed at his soul. For reasons he couldn't quite fathom, Ben Zark felt as though something precious was slipping away from him, slipping through his fingers like grains of sand. It was a sensation both unsettling and inexplicable, leaving him grappling with a profound sense of loss. Opening his eyes, Benzark found himself bathed in the warm glow of sunlight filtering through the windows of a familiar room. The sight of the red curtains and the elegant furnishing stirred something deep within him, evoking memories of moments long past. It was a place he knew well, yet its familiarity only served to deepen the ache in his heart. Duke Banzark, welcome back. Count Lawton's voice echoed through the corridors of his mansion, jolting Banzark out of his bewildered state. It felt like a surreal moment, as if he were caught in the midst of a dream or a haunting memory. As he tried to make sense of his surroundings, Banzark realized with a start that he was in Count Lawton's mansion. But how had he ended up here? He racked his brain, attempting to recall the events that had led him to this peculiar situation. He remembered falling asleep after dinner, but beyond that, everything was a blur. His confusion only deepened when he found himself unable to move his legs, as if they were held captive by an invisible force. Panic began to well up within him as he struggled against the invisible bonds that held him in place. Was this the work of Azura, or was it something else entirely? His thoughts were interrupted by Count Lawton's voice, drifting faintly from the corridor. The words pierced through the haze of confusion, sending a shiver down Benzark's spine. I'm embarrassed to show her to Duke Benzark because she is inadequate in many ways. Suddenly, a scene unfolded before Benzark's eyes as if he were witnessing a fragment of his past come to life. His past self stood before him, clad in his uniform, a smirk playing at his lips. It was the day he had first met Adeline, a memory that had long been buried beneath layers of time. As the scene played out before him, Benzark felt a surge of frustration and annoyance wash over him. Was this some kind of twisted dream, or perhaps a prophecy? The lines between past and present blurred, leaving him disoriented and unsure of what was real and what was merely a figment of his imagination. With a shake of his head, Benzark attempted to ground himself in reality, to shake off the unsettling sensation that gripped him. But the nagging feeling of uncertainty lingered, leaving him to grapple with the unsettling notion that perhaps some mysteries were not meant to be unraveled. 
Benzark's mind swirled with a whirlwind of thoughts as he observed his past self engaging in a conversation that he couldn't quite comprehend. Was he truly considering such a callous course of action? The idea of marrying Adeline seemed absurd to his current sensibilities. Why go through the trouble when they could simply apprehend her and confine her? It was a notion that baffled him, yet it offered a glimpse into the mindset of his former self, a reminder of the person he once was. His gaze lingered on the reflection of his past self, scrutinizing every detail with a mixture of frustration and curiosity. How could he have been so oblivious to the repercussions of his actions? The memory seemed to taunt him, dredging up feelings of regret and unease. Amidst his internal turmoil, the arrival of Lady Adeline brought a shift in the atmosphere of the room. Anticipation crackled in the air as Benzark's eyes fixated on the figure entering through the door, her presence commanding attention even in her timidity. As Lady Adeline approached, her demeanor seemed to falter under the weight of expectation. Benzark watched intently, his brow furrowing slightly at the sight of her apparent unease. Count Lawton's impatient reprimand only served to heighten the tension, casting a pall over the encounter. When Lady Adeline finally mustered the courage to speak, her words came out in a hesitant murmur, her voice trembling with uncertainty. Benzark's expression remained impassive as he regarded her, his demeanor cool and detached. Yet behind his composed facade, a tumult of emotions churned within him. Their eyes met, and in that fleeting moment, a silent exchange passed between them. There was a depth to Lady Adeline's gaze that stirred something within Ben's arc, a stirring of recognition tinged with apprehension. It was as if they were two puzzle pieces, each bearing a fragment of the other's truth, on the brink of fitting together to reveal the bigger picture. As the echoes of Lady Adeline's introduction lingered in the air, Ben Zark found himself grappling with a myriad of conflicting emotions. It was a peculiar sensation, being confronted with a version of himself from the past, while simultaneously facing the enigmatic presence of Lady Adeline. In that moment, the lines between past and present blurred, leaving Ben Zark to navigate the labyrinth of his own memories and desires. Adeline's introduction was hesitant her voice trembling as she spoke the words of formalities. Her cheeks flushed crimson with embarrassment, and she avoided meeting Benzark's gaze, unable to muster the confidence she once possessed. It was a stark departure from the Adeline he remembered, vibrant and self-assured. This sudden transformation puzzled Benzark, leaving him to question the cause of her subdued demeanor. As he brushed past her with a trace of irritation, he couldn't shake the feeling of unease that gripped him. The Adeline he encountered in this vision was a far cry from the spirited woman he once knew. Was this truly the same person he had crossed paths with in the past? The disparity between the two versions of Adeline left him bewildered. Even Aster, walking behind him, commented on Adeline's reserved demeanor, noting her lack of interest. Yet Ben Zark remained indifferent, dismissing her behavior as inconsequential. Despite his outward composure, a sense of disquiet lingered within him, a nagging uncertainty about the true nature of the woman before him. Their exchange was tinged with tension, Aster's skepticism contrasting with Benzark's stoicism. While Aster expressed doubts about Adeline's capabilities, Benzark's mind was preoccupied with the enigma of her subdued demeanor. The weight of their impending partnership hung heavy in the air, overshadowed by the lingering uncertainty surrounding Adeline's true intentions. As they walked, Ben Zark couldn't shake the feeling of unease that gnawed at him. Adeline's transformation raised more questions than answers, leaving him to grapple with the unsettling notion that the woman he once knew may have undergone a profound change. Amidst the uncertainty, one thing remained clear. The path ahead would be fraught with challenges, and Adeline's true nature remained shrouded in mystery. Aster's murmured acknowledgement fell upon Benzark's ears as he contemplated Adeline's fate with callous indifference. His words, uttered without a second thought, echoed through the empty space, leaving a bitter taste in the air. Unbeknownst to him, another version of himself watched on in disbelief, startled by the coldness of his own demeanor towards Adeline. Meanwhile, Adeline stood alone, her tears betraying the hurt caused by Benzark's dismissive words. Though he and Aster had already departed through the door, Adeline's heartache lingered, 
her sorrow evident in the silent tears that streamed down her cheeks. Even in her solitude, her pain was palpable, a stark reminder of the callousness she had encountered. In the next scene presented by the vision, Benzark found himself transported to the forest of darkness, cradling Adeline's unconscious form in his arms. Aster's irritation was palpable as he commented on the inconvenience of Adeline's condition, his annoyance mirroring Benzark's silent vigil over the vulnerable woman in his arms. As Benzark traced the contours of Adeline's face with gentle fingertips, a sense of awe washed over him, prompting a whispered acknowledgement of her beauty. The revelation struck a chord within him, stirring emotions that he had long suppressed. Yet, even as he marveled at her delicate features, doubt crept in, questioning the authenticity of his newfound admiration. Meanwhile, the other Benzark stood frozen in disbelief, grappling with the inexplicable convergence of his emotions with those of his counterpart. Was he losing his grip on reality, or was this vision a manifestation of his deepest desires? As he observed the tender moment unfolding before him, he struggled to reconcile the conflicting emotions swirling within him, torn between skepticism and undeniable attraction. Adeline's eyelids fluttered, revealing the depths of her mesmerizing purple gaze. In that fleeting moment, her eyes locked with Benzark's, igniting a silent exchange that spoke volumes. Sensing the weight of their connection, Adeline gently extricated herself from Benzark's embrace, her cheeks flushing with a warmth mirrored by the crimson hue staining his ears. I am sorry. Adeline's apology hung in the air, her unease palpable as she turned away, her discomfort evident in her fidgeting. Observing her reaction, Benzark withdrew his hand, contemplating her aversion to his touch. If she recoiled from his presence, he reasoned, he must tread more cautiously, a revelation that left him disquieted and unsettled. Standing now, their surroundings shrouded in darkness, Adeline's confusion mirrored Benzark's own as she questioned their location. This is the forest of darkness. He responded evenly, his tone betraying no hint of empathy or concern. As a nearby tree stirred to life, Adeline recoiled in fear, her startled cry piercing the silence. The sight prompted surprise from the other Benzark, who had never witnessed Adeline's vulnerability before. Whether you like it or not, you have to live here from now on. You'd better get used to it, Benzark declared coldly, his words laced with a harshness that sent a shiver down Adeline's spine. With a murmured apology, she averted her gaze, her posture betraying her distress. Let's move away. Benzark's directive marked the beginning of their journey, with Aster leading the way as Benzark trailed behind, lost in thought. Uncertain of how to proceed, he struggled to find the right words to address Adeline, his lack of experience with women leaving him at a loss. Turning to her with a sidelong glance, he beckoned her closer, his voice tinged with an unexpected directive. Hey, your name is Adeline Benzark from today. You'd better be a useful duchess. Though his words were brusque, they carried an unspoken weight, a testament to the weight of their newfound connection. As Adeline absorbed his command, her eyes concealed by her bangs, Benzark couldn't shake the feeling that their fates were inexorably intertwined. As Benzark awakened from his reverie, he found himself lying on his bed, bathed in the gentle glow of sunlight filtering through the window. Reflecting on the vivid scenes that had played out in his mind, he couldn't shake the lingering feeling of melancholy that clung to him. Adeline's voice, laden with sadness, resonated in his thoughts, haunting him with its quiet desperation. As he pondered the surreal experience, he couldn't help but wonder, was it merely a dream, or something more profound? He stepped out onto the balcony of his room, his demeanor visibly perturbed. Clad in his usual comfortable attire, his disheveled hair fell across his forehead. The melodious chirping of birds filled the air, a stark contrast to his troubled countenance. Amidst the radiant beams of sunlight, he pondered aloud. Was it a dream? Casting a scrutinizing gaze upon his hands, he mulled over the possibility. Observing the bustling activity below in the market area, he remained transfixed, grappling with the perplexing notion of dreaming within the confines of the mansion. Why did such a phenomenon occur here, where he had never experienced it before? Could it be, as some posit, 
that dreams reflect unconscious desires? The thought nod at him. Was Adele's presence in the dream a manifestation of his own unspoken yearnings? It seemed inconceivable. He had never wished to see Adele wear such a despondent expression, reminiscent of her pre-marriage portrayal as submissive and powerless, as Astor had described her. This stark contrast to the Adele he knew troubled him deeply, leaving him restless and unable to find solace. Meanwhile, in her own chamber, Adeline wrestled with her own turmoil, unable to find respite in slumber. Tormented by her actions earlier in the day, she tossed and turned, consumed by worry over his perception of her behavior. The weight of her unease prevented even a moment's rest, leaving her in a state of disquietude. Suddenly jolted awake by cold sweats, she found herself unable to shake the unsettling thoughts that plagued her mind. What should I do? She fretted, recalling her abrupt departure from Ben Zark earlier in the afternoon. The memory gnawed at her with a sense of unease. Folding her arms atop her knees, she pondered the suddenness of her exit, aware of the potential discomfort it may have caused him. Gripping the blanket tightly with embarrassment, she mused over the implications of her actions. Despite Benzark's evident transformation from their past encounters, she feared his disappointment this time around. Would history repeat itself? With a heavy sigh, she buried her face in her arms, shutting out the world momentarily. Rousing herself from her introspection, she tossed the blanket aside and rose from the bed, clad in her nightgown. Determination etched on her features, she resolved to make amends. All right, I should apologize for now, she murmured, slipping on her shoes and draping a robe over her night attire before venturing out of her room toward Benzark's quarters within the same suite. Though apprehensive about the prospect of falling in love again, she was equally adamant about not allowing awkwardness to hinder her interactions with him. As she strode purposefully forward, her resolve faltered momentarily upon spotting Ben Zark on the balcony. Ray! She called out, her voice laced with concern, wondering if his presence signaled discontent over their earlier encounter. Oh, you woke up! He greeted politely, his fatigue evident in the heavy circles under his eyes, betraying his lack of rest. Her worry deepened at the sight, prompting her to inquire about his well-being. Good timing, I had something to ask you. He began slowly, drawing her closer. Ray, she repeated, her concern mounting as she observed his troubled demeanor. Oh my gosh, your face, did something happen to you? She queried, her gaze fixed upon him. No, not really. Rather than that, Adele, do you also have dreams, my dear? He asked his tone laden with desperation, as though the answer held profound significance to him. Caught off guard by the intensity of his inquiry, she responded incredulously. Dreams. Is there anyone who doesn't have dreams? Yet, in that moment, realization dawned upon her. Her husband, Adeva, was exempt from ordinary dreams, save for prophecies. Embarrassment flooded her as she recalled this fact chastising herself for jumping to conclusions without considering his unique nature. But why are you asking about dreams? She inquired, her curiosity piqued by Benzark's sudden interest. I was wondering if you had any dreams last night. Benzark responded, his gaze fixed on her face. Let's see. I don't exactly remember. I haven't actually recalled any dreams recently. Well, dreams usually become blurry once you wake up. Ah, uh, is it because I talked in my sleep? She interjected, a sense of shock coloring her tone as she considered the possibility. No, I was just curious about those things called dreams. Ben Zark replied, averting his gaze, a hint of something concealed within his eyes. It seemed Adele's night had been uneventful. Did that mean he was the sole dreamer? Meanwhile, Adeline struggled to recall her purpose for being there, tapping her chin with her finger in contemplation. When the reason dawned upon her, she turned her attention to Ben Zark, initiating a moment of tense silence between them. While Ben Zark continued to survey the market below, Adeline mustered the courage to broach the subject of her earlier departure. Berm. Ray, about yesterday evening. I thought about it again, and I think leaving like that was my mistake, so I'd like to apologize. She began, her voice tentative as she cast her gaze downward. No, what? 
Benzark's surprised reaction halted her mid-sentence, catching her off guard. He hadn't anticipated her apology. Don't apologize, he interjected, his tone cold and stern, sending a chill down her spine. She faltered, reminded of the timid Adeline from his dream. I don't want anything like your apology, he continued abruptly, his demeanor rigid. Frustration welled up within him as memories of Adele from his dream clouded his thoughts. I see. I was overstepping my boundaries once again. She murmured, her eyes hidden behind her bangs as she turned away, her heart aching with disappointment. What had she expected? Ben Zark had always been this way. Let's go down to eat. Wacken should be waiting as well. She suggested softly, her voice tinged with sadness and resignation as she began to walk away. A hey Adele. Benzark's silent plea echoed in his heart, a desperate urge to reach out to her and dispel the sorrow etched upon her face. He couldn't shake the nagging concern. Why was she wearing the same expression he had seen in his dream? The trio found themselves seated outdoors, with Wacken positioned between them, engrossed in devouring his meal with unrestrained enthusiasm. Wow, eating outside is great. I only apply for outdoor missions because of the food. Wacken exclaimed between bites, his delight palpable as he indulged in his meal, juggling a meat skewer and fork with glee. The food in the duchy isn't too good, for sure. So that was why you kept going out for missions, huh? Adeline chuckled, teasingly probing into Wacken's culinary preferences. As Wacken scratched his neck in response, Ben Zark, standing beside him, appeared nonchalant, sipping his coffee quietly. Yet, his apparent indifference belied his keen interest in their conversation. Haha, please keep it a secret from AAS, Wacken pleaded, his demeanor shifting from jovial to beseeching. I wonder about that one, Adeline mused teasingly, her hand propped against her cheek, playfully teasing Wacken. His eyes widened in response, silently imploring her compliance. I'm going to go get a drink. Adeline announced, rising from her chair and informing the others before walking away. Okay, come back soon. Wacken waved after her, while Benzark's gaze followed her departure, a fleeting moment of silent observation passing between him and Wacken. Captain, did you have a fight with Adeline? I even left on purpose yesterday so that you two could have dinner together. Have you realized that you haven't even talked to each other at all today? Wacken's tone escalated, his face flushed with restrained anger as he confronted Ben Zark. I'm also troubled right now, so stay silent. Ben Zark sighed, his frustration evident as he beseeched Wacken for quiet. Holding his head in his hands, he grappled with the tumultuous emotions swirling within him. Arg, this is seriously frustrating, Wacken slowly said in anger and he realized how Maven was the one who even insisted that Wacken shouted let them stay together all the time. He remembered Maven's smiling face as he was sitting there angrily while folding his arms across his chest and pouting cutely. Please read the mood, Wacken Dash. Maven's words echoed in his ears again. Hey, Wacken, have you ever had a dream? Ben Zark suddenly redirected his attention towards Wacken, his inquiry catching the latter off guard. Huh? A dream? Wacken responded with confusion evident in his expression. No, I haven't. He shook his head decisively, dismissing the notion altogether. Not even once? No. Why are you asking the obvious? I never even got a prophecy. Wacken explained, offering insight into his lack of dream experiences. Then, what about AAS? Ben Zark pressed further his focus unwavering as he prodded Wacken while spearing a piece of meat with his fork. Wacken's reaction was immediate, his shock rendering him momentarily speechless, goosebumps prickling across his skin. How am I supposed to know about his dreams? And regardless of the content, if one of us had a dream, then word about it would have spread already. But why are you asking about that? Did you have a dream? Wacken replied, his words interspersed with slow deliberate munching as he savored his food. No. I was just wondering if it's possible to have a dream that's not a prophecy. Ben Zark pondered aloud, 
his hand resting against his face in contemplation. You are wondering about some strange things. I've lived for over 100 years before entering into tranquility, but I've never heard of a deva having a dream. If that ever happens, rumors about it would spread since it would be such a curious incident. Oh, wait, maybe they would be ashamed of it. Wacken remarked casually, waving his hand dismissively before reaching for his cup on the table. What do you mean, ashamed? Ben Zark interjected, curiosity piqued by Wacken's offhand comment. I heard humans protect their weak mentality through dreams, so it's a kind of auto-hypnosis or something. Wacken remarked, his eyes rolling as he took a sip from his cup. Ben Zark's mind froze at this revelation. Did this mean he had a dream that Deva aren't supposed to have, all to protect his own mentality? The thought sent shivers down his spine leaving him momentarily paralyzed in contemplation. Captain? Wacken's concerned voice pierced through his reverie, drawing his attention back to the present moment. Come on, gentlemen. Have you finished eating? Suddenly, their attention was diverted upwards as Adeline stood before them, her bright smile illuminating the space. Hey, Adeline! Wacken exclaimed, pleasantly surprised by her appearance. It's about time we start moving, she announced with a slow, confident smile. Hmm? Are we going somewhere? Wacken inquired, taken aback by the sudden change in plans, while Ben Zark listened intently, absorbing the information. Oh, did you forget? We are going to earn money in the gladiator contest. Adeline blushed, her confidence shining through as she leaned forward, hands resting on the table. That's why I'd like to ask, how much money do you have right now? Her question hung in the air, eliciting surprise from both Wacken and Benzark. After a brief moment, they pulled together all the money they had on the table. Adeline meticulously counted the coins, stacking them neatly. Ten gold, fifty silver, and about six hundred and fifty-five talent. She announced the total, her gaze shifting between her companions. Nice, then, that money... Give it all to me, she declared, extending her hand expectantly, her bright smile belying her confidence. The citizens of Mokran City gathered around the notice board where the names of the fighters and their scheduled matches were listed. They navigated through the crowd to reach the board, engaging in whispered conversations and lively gossip about the upcoming matches. Adeline and Ben Zark walked together, approaching the board amidst the bustling crowd. Adeline scanned the board intently before turning to her companions. The one we need to pay attention to is the Great Thief of Hell, she remarked, pointing to the name with her index finger. Do you also know who that is, Benzark? She noticed Benzark's confusion, realizing he wasn't familiar with the fighter, but she was confident Wacken knew who she was referring to. Wacken nodded in confirmation. I'm sure everyone knows given his consistent victories in the gladiator contest. That's why many people will be betting on the great thief of hell, Wacken added, expressing his agreement with a pensive expression, while scratching his chin. Yes, and there will be many people like me who only bet on the great thief of hell. Adeline recalled the distinct appearance of the formidable fighter. Now then, here's a question. How can we win all the money that people bet on the great thief of hell? She posed the question prompting both Ben Zark and Wacken to listen intently, eager to hear her strategy. However, she decided to let them ponder for a moment. Hmm, we would need to bet on his opponent instead of the great thief, and the great thief would need to miraculously lose. Wacken mused thoughtfully before shaking his head, realizing the complexity of such a plan. Ha! Huh? No way. Ben Zark expressed disbelief knowing it was improbable for the great thief to lose considering his undefeated record. Adeline chuckled, pleased that Wacken grasped her point precisely, while Ben Zark observed their interactions silently. Correct answer, Adeline affirmed, winking at Wacken. In the finals, I'll bet everything on the great thief's opponent instead of the great thief himself. Ben Zark's surprise was evident on his face as he struggled to comprehend her plan. As for the result... Do you want to see for yourself? Adeline teased, placing her index finger on her lips with a smile. Meanwhile, in an office room, a man sat at his desk holding the bedding paper, 
clearly marked with Adeline's stamp after she wagered all her money on the great thief's opponent. Who the hell is this person to bet so much money on this riffraff? He inquired, addressing another person calmly reading a newspaper on the sofa. Are you sure they stamped the seal personally? He waved the paper in the air. Yes, it's real. There's no reason for us to refuse since she wants to hand over all of her money. The man with the newspaper and a tobacco pipe in his mouth responded calmly. Well, that's true. The man at the desk smiled and scratched his neck. By the way, how is the great thief of hell doing? He inquired, standing up and folding his arms across his chest as he walked toward the sofa. He reached the semifinals without a single scratch. The man with the newspaper replied. Then how about the wolf fawn that she bet on? The man on the sofa asked. That guy? He looked like a weak ass. It's pure luck that he got into the finals. The newspaper reader rolled his eyes and removed the tobacco pipe from his lips. I watched him closely because I was curious as to what kind of person he was from the amount of money she bet, but he's not exactly worth the attention. He remarked carelessly, resuming smoking from his pipe. Oops, it's time for the finals soon. The orange-haired man announced upon hearing the shouting and cheering voices from outside, indicating the imminent start of the match. Well, let's go make bank. The newspaper reader agreed, folding the newspaper and placing it on the table before leaving. The great thief of hell is entering. The announcement echoed through the arena as the fighter made his grand entrance. The crowd erupted into shouts and cheers, creating a cacophony of noise. The finals are starting now. Another announcement blared over the speakers, signaling the beginning of the much-anticipated match. Adeline placed a bag full of gold in front of Ben Zark and Wacken, smiling proudly. She knew they were taken aback and surprised by her gesture. Here is the 2,000 gold I won today through the bet, she declared proudly, recognizing it as a significant achievement. 2 th thousand gold. I'm sure it used to be just ten gold, fifty silver, and something. Wacken exclaimed in disbelief, his mind struggling to comprehend the sudden increase in wealth. He felt a cold sweat of disbelief forming on his brow. Yes, it multiplied into two thousand gold, Adeline affirmed, nodding her head in confirmation. Wacken gulped, realizing that one gold coin was enough money for two commoners to live on for their entire lives. Let's get going. There's no reason to stay any longer since we accomplished our objective. Adeline began to walk ahead, her head held high with pride and her hands folded behind her back. Meanwhile, Wacken continued to stutter, still trying to process the staggering turn of events. Wait there for a moment. They were about to leave when someone stopped them. Adeline turned around, her expression one of confusion as she faced an old man holding a stick, his long, light gray hair adding to his distinguished appearance. There was a suspicious look in his eyes, and Adeline noted the guards accompanying him. Considering the timing and the guards, could he be the arena's owner? Yes, I am. Who might you be? Adeline responded calmly, her tone composed despite the unexpected interruption. I heard you made an interesting gamble, the old man remarked with intrigue. Oh my, did the rumor spread already? Adeline feigned surprise, her tone laced with amusement. I heard you gambled in a different way than the others. What kind of trick did you use? The old man questioned, fixing her with a scrutinizing gaze. Oh my, that makes it almost sound like I cheated or something. By the way, I didn't expect that this small amount of money would be worth an investigation. Adeline retorted, meeting his gaze with a chuckle. Of course there would be an investigation if it looked like a trick was used. The game wouldn't be fun otherwise, the old man stated, raising his hand in emphasis. Adeline snickered at his notion of fun. Fun. I guess that fun is only supposed to be fun for you. You remained silent when the arena won all the money that the spectators lost, yet you came running to me in surprise because it was the other way around this time. Don't you think that's rather dastardly? Adeline remarked carelessly, twirling a strand of her hair in a manner designed to provoke annoyance. What did you say? How dare you speak like that to our master? 
one of the guards interjected, drawing his sword and shouting. However, before the guard could react further, Wacken appeared behind him, sword at the guard's neck, issuing a chilling warning. You'd better behave properly. I'll send your head flying if you make the slightest movement. Wacken growled menacingly into the guard's ear, sending a shiver down the old man's spine. Caught off guard, he realized he'd better not act rashly. Meanwhile, the old man's attention shifted to Benzark standing beside Adeline. His eyes widened as he recognized Benzark's face, taking a moment to realize who he was. The realization struck him like lightning. Was this person standing before him the Duke of Darkness? And was she his wife? Of all people, it had to be that Duke. Despite his initial anger, the old man laughed nervously, attempting to lighten the tense atmosphere. Calm down, I didn't come here to fight. I was just doing my job as the arena's owner. If I knew the duke was here, I would have prepared a proper reception. I apologize for not having recognized you, Duke Benzark. The old man stammered, his voice now polite as he broke into a cold sweat. I don't think I'm the one you should have recognized, Benzark replied icily, his tone cutting through the tension in the air. What? The old man's eyes widened in realization. This old man has poor hearing and didn't understand it too well. He apologized, placing his hand on his chest and bowing slightly in a formal manner. It was my wife, not me, who received your disrespectful behavior. You'd better behave properly, Ben Zark stated coldly, fixing the old man with a stern glare. Silently, the old man met Ben Zark's gaze, recognizing the gravity of the situation. He knew Ben Zark was a notorious figure, capable of erasing someone like him with ease. With this realization, he swallowed hard and bowed further, offering a sincere apology as he should have done earlier. I was blinded by my foolishness and didn't recognize the lady. Please allow me to greet you once again. My name is Peter, the leader of Mokran City. Please feel free to tell me anything you need during your stay in Mokran City, Peter said politely. His tone transformed into one of genuine respect as he introduced himself and extended hospitality. Adeline observed the interaction with indifference, unaffected by the old man's sudden change in demeanor. What? Did the great thief of hell really lose? Avid asked in surprise, unable to believe the unexpected turn of events. My money is gone. Arg, I bet on the great thief. Avid lamented, rolling his eyes in frustration. Yes, it's completely gone. I heard he made a silly mistake during the finals. Koken informed him sharing the disappointing news. Ugh. Old man Peter must have earned a lot. I should have worked for the arena instead of becoming a mercenary. Avid grumbled angrily as he took a sip from his beer glass, his frustration evident. About that, Captain. I heard the one who won the money wasn't the arena's owner, and it was Adeline Lawton instead. Koken hesitated before delivering the news. Avid was stunned, and he choked on his drink, unable to swallow properly. Why, out of nowhere, did it have to be her? Avid exclaimed in disbelief, his shock palpable. 